Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. It's uh, five minutes past 10. Just want to welcome everybody uh, to this public meeting on the war in Ukraine and what socialists um, should fight for and call for. My name is Brian Watson. I'm a member of the Reform and Revolution Caucus. And this meeting is hosted by Reform and Revolution, which is a Marxist caucus in DSA. Um, and we're really pleased to have everybody here today. Um, we have a really exciting lineup of speakers today. And um, I just want to introduce uh, everybody who's speaking today. Um, so we have Paul Murphy, who's a Marxist member of the Irish Parliament uh, for People Before Profits, an eco-socialist party and is active in RISE, a network of revolutionary socialists within People Before Profit. I just wanna welcome Paul. We also have Grayson Lanza, who is an outgoing co-chair of Orlando DSA and a rank and file member of the International Committee. So I wanna welcome Grayson to the meeting, thank you. Uh, we also have Neil Meyer who will be speaking and he is the editor of The Call which is an online publication of DSA's uh, caucus, uh, Bread and Roses. Welcome, Neil. And we also have Philip Locker, a member of the Steering Committee of Reform and Revolution, uh, which is the hosting organization that, or caucus of this meeting. And uh, Reform and Revolution, like I mentioned before, is a Marxist caucus in DSA. And if comrades are interested in finding out more about what Reform and Revolution is about, um, We'll be posting links. Uh, we also produce a news or a magazine uh, called Reform Revolution, um, and we'll also post links about that as well. Um, but before we get to the main speakers, we are fortunate enough to have um, uh, Stephanie Gallardo speaking today, who is um, a teacher, an activist, and a democratic socialist member of Seattle DSA. And she is running for Congress in Washington State's ninth district against the chair of the Armed Service Committee in the House of Representatives. And that is um, Adam Smith is who she's running against. And he is definitely bankrolled by the defense industry, industries. Um, and Stephanie is going to kick us off with a little bit about why she's running in her campaign. And go ahead, Stephanie, thanks for being here. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to share space with you and also honored to receive the invite to, to be here today. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Stephanie Gallardo. I am a candidate for Congress in the 9th Congressional District. Um, and you know what? I actually don't wanna talk about my campaign today. I would really love to you know, stick to Ukraine and give you a little bit of background um, about why I feel the way I do about the, what's going on between Ukraine and Russia and of course, all the other actors in the situation. Um, so if I might, I just would love to read something to you all, um, and it'll make a little bit more sense um, once I get to the end of it. So just give me one second. All right, here we go. <clears throat> My problem was being too well known. As a politician, I had contacts all over Southern Chile. Sure enough, my name was on a military edict published the day of the coup on September 11th, 1973. I kept asking myself, why should I be hunted like a deer? My party has been legal in this country for the past 32 years. This was democracy, wasn't it? It was the 19th. It was a night I don't want to remember. There was nothing refined about the torture. I was beaten mercilessly, kicked, pummeled, spat upon. They took me to a presidio called Chin Chin, 1,000 prisoners in 27 cells. Two miles from Chin Chin was a torture center. You could hear the screams from that far away. They took me there one night and placed electrodes all over my body, even the most sensitive parts. When the current was turned on, I bit my tongue so hard, the blood flowed out of my mouth and down my neck. I couldn't scream. I was choking, so they turned it off and cleaned me up. Then a soldier said to me, listen, dummy, you didn't make any noise or cry. That's bad. 
Now we have to do it again. And they did. This time, I screamed my head off. The foam spewed out of my mouth, and only then were they satisfied. It's strange. After a while, you begin to prefer one form of torture over another. You say to yourself, oh God, I hope they only beat me this time and knock out a few teeth. Anything but the electrodes. It's a complete breakdown of self. Okay, so um, the words that I just shared with you, of course, are not mine. Um, they are actually my grandfather's. Um, his name was Atilio Gallardo, and he was a refugee who arrived here um, in 1976 with my father and uh, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother. And, um, you know, the reason I actually put this together in a speech a couple days ago, um, I was doing a press conference for um, this group of candidates coming together from across the West Coast. We're calling it the Left Coast Alliance. And, um, you know, I wanted to share these words specifically because while the actors in the scenario um, with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia are, are of course different and the historical um, you know, facts of the situation are different, um, at the root, what we know is going on here, right, is imperialism in, in all of its forms. And so I wanted to share this today um, because I wanted to just highlight the fact that there are so many um, unintended consequences of um, you know, the, the the results of imperialism that you know imperialists may or may not think about. Honestly, they might think about them. They probably do know exactly what's going on, um, but they are too steeped in power and too steeped in you know their motivations um, to to consider things like this. And so, um, you know, when it comes to Ukraine, I am um, very firm on uh, you know what I believe. First and foremost, I think sanctions. Um, are completely uncalled for. And, um, you know, part of the speech that I was reading earlier um, explains a little bit about how the sanctions impacted my family prior to the coup. Um, sanctions on, you know, Chile completely made it difficult to access food, gas, things that were, you know, needed for everyday life in Chile. And so what I know is that, you know, sanctions impact the people. They don't necessarily impact the oligarchs that, um, you know, are talked about on the TV every single day. And so um, at the end of the day, you know, of course, I want to stand 100% um, in solidarity with folks that are in Ukraine. I also want to, you know, stand up with, uh, you know, anti-war Russia pro protesters. Um, and at that, you know, what I really think that we need to be doing um, is considering how we can move forward in light of what's happened, because there's so much rhetoric around, around Ukraine and Russia. And it's also been very noticeable to me um, how people have just completely opened their hearts to the people of Ukraine, the refugees of Ukraine, um, as opposed to, you know, Haitian refugees or other people, other different types of refugees. And so I just want to, you know, call that to question. And I want to ask, you know, why is that? And I, I feel like most of us in this, in this group here, we know exactly why that is. Um, and so, you know, I'll start there. I'm not sure if, if folks have questions or, you know, want to be in conversation with me. I don't want to take up too much time. And I also will say one final, I'm extremely sorry. I usually don't have to leave these meetings when I'm, when I'm uh, talking with folks, but I do have something to get to in just a few minutes. Um, but I, do, I would like to be in conversation with folks if, if you're interested. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, we're going to... Uh, Going to move on in the agenda just because it's a, it's a tight agenda, uh, but I, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, thank you so much. And I dropped a link to your campaign page uh, in the chat, so if anybody wants to check that out, please do. Thank you. Can I just say one last thank you to Rick absolutely, absolutely appreciate you all putting this together, and I uh, stand with y'all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on in the agenda. Um, so how what's going to work is that we have Paul Murphy, uh, like I said before, a Marxist member of the Irish Parliament. And we thought we would start with uh, Paul to frame uh, you know this from an international perspective, and then we'll move to the to the US based socialists uh, and give them an opportunity to speak, we'll have a number of questions that the US comrades can res respond to, and then we'll have uh, a period of open 
uh, political discussion. Um, and then we'll come back to the, uh, to the US socialist panelists and uh, have them answer some questions and, and, and round us off um, with some sum ups. So we'll start with Paul um, to give us the US or to give us an international perspective. Are you ready there, Paul? Can you hear me okay? I can. Great, thanks, Pat, Brian. Um, and thanks a lot to Orinor for inviting me and for, for hosting this discussion, because I think that um, we're all, and I can imagine particularly in the US and in Russia, we're subject to an immense amount of propaganda at the moment. And it's having a, I think, a confusing and disorientating effect on a lot of people um, around the left causing you know real disagreements debates which we need to have out about how the left should respond um so i i try in 15 minutes to like broadly set out what is obviously a very complicated uh, topic and um, but that i'm genuinely interested in uh, the discussion and the debate that that follows um the first thing i think for today's meeting but also i think for how socialists need to respond um, to what is happening is to say very clearly that we stand in solidarity as stephanie said with the ukrainian people who are facing a horrendous russian imperialist invasion um, the humanitarian impacts are horrendous already about what 10 days into the invasion you have 1.5 million refugees and um, different estimates are saying that could go up to 4 million to 6 million uh, people um, you've close to a thousand uh, civilians killed uh, so far. Um, and I just think, you know, we need to be absolutely clear in our opposition to the Russian invasion. There is no justification. Um, and we have to very clearly say and call for the Russian troops to be uh, withdrawn. And I don't think, obviously, there are elements of the left. I think they're pretty in a minority at this stage, but I, I, I think it would be a big mistake to fall for any of Putin's wartime propaganda in terms of why he's engaged in this struggle. Um, so, you know, when he says he's doing it to defend the rights of the Russian speaking people in Ukraine as a whole, or to defend the rights of people in the Donbass, I don't think that we should believe him. And that isn't to say that there hasn't been real discrimination against Russian speakers in Ukraine since 2014. There clearly has be, been. That isn't to say there isn't a denial of the right to self-determination of ethnic Russians within the borders of what is internationally recognized Ukraine. I think there is. But we don't have to bias that he is in any way concerned about those things or that they are his motivations. Um, similarly, when he says this is a struggle for denazification, um, we, we shouldn't buy it because we know that, um, I mean, Putin's record, even just to look in a very limited way at who he funds on the European continent, he funds forces of the, the far right, for example, Le, Le Pen in, in France, lots of connections and so on. Um, and obviously we all know how to react to the idea that his troops have gone in as quote unquote peacekeepers, and um, because obviously he borrowed that idea from US imperialism. Um, and um, I, I don't think we have to search very far for his um, for his his rationale for what he's engaged in. I mean, you look at the speech that he made when the invasion uh, started, and he does spell it out there. Um, and he spells it out that it basically it's an inv an invasion in the tradition of great Russian chauvinism and nationalism. That that is what it is. Um, and explicitly and kind of interestingly, in a sense, he blames Lenin and the Bolsheviks and the policy of self-determination for the very existence of Ukraine. Um, so he says in the speech uh, that they're responsible for separating, severing, severing what is historically Russian land. And he wants to reassert that this becomes Russian land uh, again. Um, and he says that modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia or to be more precise by Bolshevik communist uh, Russia, Lenin and his associates did in a way that was extremely harsh on, on Russia. So it is a reactionary imperialist uh, project of the invasion of uh, Russia. And we have to stand in solidarity with those resisting that uh, invasion in terms of the Ukrainian people um, and uh, for the immediate withdrawal and unconditional withdrawal of, of Russian troops. 
I think that is absolutely vital and is the first thing that we have to say. Um, but I also think it isn't all that we have to, to say, and it isn't all to the entire global picture in terms of what is taking place here. Um, because in my opinion, as, as well as being an imperialist invasion of a former colony, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is also part of a conflict between major powers in the world, what Marxists would historically you know, ca categorize as an inter-imperialist conflict. Um, on the one hand, Russia and its allies, Belarus, etc., cetera, um, and on the other hand, what can be grouped together as Western imperialism, led by the US, and um, with NATO playing a, an instrumental role in that. Um, and that conflict between these major powers did not start 10 days ago, but it has been escalating for basically the last uh, two decades. You kind of had a decade after the collapse of Stalinism, whereby Russia was declining as a power the West, Western powers were able to march eastwards kind of very confidently. And in a way, there wasn't a lot of tension just because, because of the state of, of Russia. But in the aftermath of that, you had um, basically a conscious attempt by Western imperialism to encircle Russia. And then as Russia re-emerged as you know, very much a third rate power behind the US and China and the world, but still an imperialist power um, and tried to assert itself by firstly as a regional power, and um, there became the basis for significant tensions and clashes. Um, and this is a part of that. And um, so things that we have seen on the Russian side or Putin side from this, obviously the invasion of uh, Georgia and the intervention in Ukraine in 2014 and the various military exercises uh, we have seen. Um, but also, and I think this is something we don't hear a lot about in uh, the West. And again, it is not to say it's any justification for the invasion of uh, Ukraine, but is the fact that NATO, rather than being disbanded at the end of the Cold War, when its formal reason for existing was, was gone, in fact, expanded 800 kilometers uh, eastward um, from wh where it had previously be been round after round of integration of Eastern European states. Um, the fact that you have active battle groups, i.e. troops from outside of those countries in four Eastern, Eastern European states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Poland, the fact that you have NATO missiles in Poland and uh, Romania, the fact that you have yearly, every single year, annual exercises, military exercises called Defender Europe, which take place on Russia's uh, borders, um, involving last year close to 30,000 troops, including plus on top of that significant naval exercises in the in the Black uh, Sea. Um, and I think it is also important to see that what was described or recently by the French finance minister as all out economic and financial war on Russia, what the Financial Times describes as the West's hybrid war in Russia, the measures of sanctions and so on, that is also a part of this inter-imperialist conflict uh, which is taking place. And so while in the conflict between Russia and the invasion of Ukraine, we're on the side of ordinary Ukrainian people against the invasion for the, for the repulsion of the invasion. In the inter-imperialist conflict, which is also taking place, I do think it's important to say that we're against both sides. We're absolutely against Putin. We're absolutely against Russian imperialism, but we're also against Western imperialism in that conflict. And we're for the ending of that war by a movement of ordinary people from uh, below, um, and ideally in terms of achieving what actually was achieved, how the First World War began to come to an end, the overthrowing of the rulers and the capitalist system uh, that they stand for with the Russian Revolution in 1917. In terms of what's, what's happening now, I think it's not an exaggeration, certainly in, in Europe, and I would presume it's the case in the US, I'm interested in describing what is taking place as a certain military shock doctrine. Um, so shock doctrine is the idea that the capitalist class or whoever take a real crisis and use it to drive through a pre-existing uh, agenda. And I think what is happening now is that the righteous horror of ordinary people at the invasion of the Ukraine is being very consciously used by the governments and media in the Western world to try to undermine the opposition to imperialist adventures, which is built up over 
I mean, really since the Vietnam War, in a sense, but in particular since Iraq, Afghanistan, and how they are seen, um, that they want to overcome the resistance to Western imperialism that has built up and drive a significant further militarization of, of Europe, of the West, and further expansion of, of NATO, and are doing it very, very consciously, um, all under the guise, supposedly, of defending the Ukrainian people. Um, but just as much as we reject Putin's idea that he's defending people in, in, in the Donbass region or in Russian speakers generally, we also should reject the idea that the Western imperialists who don't care what Saudi Arabia does in Yemen, where over 300,000 people have been killed, who don't care, in fact, consciously support um, what Israel does in Palestine, um, they also don't care about in the interests of ordinary people in, in Ukraine. And in fact, they're using this crisis. And so just to give you a picture of what that looks like from a, a European perspective, is, um, I mean, a, a kind of principle of NATO is the idea that every country should spend 2% of its GDP on what's called defense spending, which is you know, weapons to, to kill people, um, to fund the benefit of the military industrial complex that Stephanie was talking about earlier that clearly fund that guy, Adam Smith, that she's, she's running against. Um, and for a long time, many European states under political pressure have not met that 2% target. Um, because they're under pressure to spend money on other things. Um, and because politically it's difficult for them to justify spending 2%. Overnight, now that 2% target is going to be reached across all these different NATO states. So overnight, Germany, which for historical reasons has difficulty in investing huge amounts of money in the military and so on, said we're going to establish a 100 billion euro fund for new militarization. And not just that, we're going to put it in the constitution. So no future government can stop funding the military to the extent of 2% every single year. Overnight, the EU, which has been on a, you know, a creeping direction consciously of militarization um, and developing a European army, but has had to move slowly and cautiously in response to an anti-war, anti-imperialist sentiment that exists. Overnight, for the first time ever, the EU as an organization has sent military aid uh, to, to anywhere, in this case to Ukraine, 500 um, a billion, 500 million euros spent, uh, sent uh, immediately, including with Ireland, a supposedly neutral country, participating in that, supposedly paying for the fuel in the tanks as opposed to the tanks themselves, as if, like, you know what I mean? There's some sort of significant difference in that. And um, in Ireland, it takes the form of an attempt to abandon all pretense at neutrality. And um, so Ireland is historically neutral, not aligned uh, with NATO in reality, facilitates the war on the people in the Middle East through the use of the Shannon Airport by the US military. Over 2 million soldiers have gone through there, but is formally neutral. Whereas now you have a huge campaign in the press by the establishment politicians everywhere, every single day to say, no, we have to abandon this uh, neutrality. We could come under attack, uh, etc." cetera. In the European Parliament, the resolution which is portrayed in the media as simply condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine, in fact, was a resolution in favor of increased defense spending in every European country, increased cooperation between the EU and NATO, and also uh, investing in liquid natural gas fossil fuel infrastructure at a time when we need to be obviously abandoning all fossil fuel uh, investment. Um, and a part of this, I'm sure it's, it's similar in, in, in the US, is the massive propaganda by the Western media around these things. So those left MEPs, and was a minority of left MEPs, unfortunately, but those left MEPs who bravely stood up to the pressure and said, no, we're not voting for further militarization. Of course, we condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They've been labeled Putin's dirty dozen um, in sections of the media, lots of headlines. In Ireland, people before profit, like very smart uh, political commentators is dubbing us Putin before people, very smart, uh, you'll see. Um, and like literally, I'm sure you've seen media programs where item one will be condemnation correctly of the Russian regime for shutting down Western media outlets. And then item two is like celebration of the fact that in the West and uh, in the European Union, for example, I presume it's the same in the US, Sputnik and RT have been uh, shut down. So media war propaganda in absolute overdrive and hunting out the kind of enemy within. Just to finish on this in terms of how we respond, I think we do have to, while standing in solidarity with Ukrainian people, we have to resist the drums of inter-imperialist conflict and uh, war, which are done under the guise of supporting the Ukrainian people. 
Um, that, in my opinion, does mean opposing sanctions by the Western powers on, uh, on Russia, um, primarily, fundamentally, because they're an instrument of that inter-imperialist conflict. Um, also, of course, we understand the humanitarian impact that they have in terms of ordinary people and the danger of escalation. Opposing um, the sending of weapons, opposing of the extension of conflict by the West. Um, you know, there's all this discussion in the media and so on around the idea of a no-fly zone, which is an extremely sanitized way of saying achieving aerial superiority, which can only be done by shooting down Russian warplanes and would take us into an open, hot conflict between nuclear uh, powers and endanger all of humanity. So to oppose those methods of escalation and oppose the sending of weapons and, and to call for the withdrawal of NATO troops um, NATO missiles from Eastern Europe and the disbandment of uh, NATO itself. Instead, what do we call for? Because obviously, people, well, what do you want to do? You say you stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. OK, but what, what are you in favor of? Firstly, opening the borders to all refugees. Um, and that's all refugees, regardless of color, uh, regardless of passport, uh, all refugees who are fleeing from uh, Ukraine, because there's been horrendous scenes by the Ukrainian military and the Polish border guards of separating people according to skin color. Um, and if you're black, leaving you there waiting for days with no food and so on. Secondly, I think a demand that hasn't got enough kind of coverage yet from the left, but it's very important, is cancelling the debts that Ukraine has. Ukraine is currently subject of an IMF program, massive austerity uh, program. 12% of all government expenditure goes on servicing the debt. That debt must be cancelled immediately. And then the third thing I think we, I think we have to do is to build the anti-war uh, movement. But the anti-war movement in Russia is enormously inspiring. Um, over 10,000 people now arrested for taking to the streets, over a million people signed petitions in conditions much more difficult than we're facing, significant numbers of people going out into the streets in opposition uh, to the war. And that can become a real force of pressure um, on, uh, on Putin. And to say we have to add to that by also building an anti-war movement in uh, the West of a substantial uh, character. Um, and I think that anti-war movement needs to say clearly, you know, Russian troops out of Ukraine, um, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we, we say that an anti-war movement has to agree to all the things that we think of as revolutionary socialists. I think there will be debate within an anti-war movement on various of the questions that I've said. But I do think it's in the, in the West that it is vital that it is an anti-war movement. I mean, I've seen, um, I think, the, 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 the PR director of NATO tweeting with the hashtag stop the war when, of course, they're engaged in their own uh, conflict. So it needs to have a principled position of calling for the troops, Russian troops out, but also say in Ireland's case, defending neutrality, or in general in the West, opposing NATO, opposing escalation, opposing NATO expansion. I just finished, sorry, I've, I've gone over time. I finished with a quote from James Connolly, um, who people, well, some people will know, other people may not know, um, is that you know, at the time of the First World War, there was uh, immense pressure on socialists on the left to go along with your own side, with your own capitalist class. And the vast majority of left organizations at that time collapsed into support for their own side. So German SPD supporting the German uh, socialists, so supporting the German side of the First uh, World War, people in the Labour Party in Britain supporting the British and so on right around the world. And it was a small minority of socialists principled who stood out against that. People like Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Keir Hardy in Scotland, but in Ireland, the person was, who was stood out most clearly is a guy called James uh, Connolly. And in 1915, so shortly after the war started, he wrote, wrote a, uh, an article, which I just very briefly quote from, which I think is a good guide for us today. He wrote, we have held and do hold that war is a relic of barbarism, only possible because we are governed by a ruling class with barbaric ideas. We have held and do hold that the working class of all countries cannot hope to escape the horrors of war until in all countries that barbaric ruling class is thrown from power. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for being here and uh, thank you for your words. Um, so we're going to move on to, um, to the US socialists. Um, and um, so there's going to be three questions um, and each of the panelists will have uh, five minutes to respond to it. Um, and 
the question is, this first question is, you know, in addition to or in contrast to what Paul outlined, how do you see um, the war in Iraq? What do you, or sorry, war in Ukraine? How do you, um, what do you think is the, what is driving it? What's the cause of it? That sort of thing. Um, and we'll start with Philip and then go to Grayson and then um, go to Neil Meyer. Um, and so the, so it'll be five minutes each and we'll start with Philip Locker from Reform Revolution. You ready there, Philip? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I really agree with the, um, I don't want to repeat the points uh, Paul made. I really agree with them. And I think, um, you know, just to highlight, I think obviously we need to absolutely oppose and loudly and clearly oppose the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, oppose, point out um, the long, unlike a lot of our governments um, who are now talking about what a authoritarian and how undemocratic Putin is, how the socialist left um, has consistently opposed uh, Putin, even when he was an ally of the US. Um, and, but also as I think, I think it's, we have a lot to be proud of in DSA that our national political committee, their statement also took a, a clear stand and really stood out by uh, calling for an end to NATO and framing, explaining that the US's policy has helped set the stage the expansion of NATO and the aggressive imperialist policy of the US government set the stage for this. I guess the angle I'll come, I mean, just to bring a little more of a US angle on it, what I would add is I think we do have a problem, which I would like to center in the discussion in that we made huge strides forward uh, in the US left the last few years with the elect, with the growth of DSA and the election of a, uh, um, a, a socialist delegation into Congress with Bernie Sanders and four members of DSA. Uh, but I do think we need to put squarely, and I think it was lacking in the DSA statement on the agenda, put squarely on the agenda that the socialist representation in Congress has been severely lacking. Um, I don't think they're putting forward a clear cut uh, anti-war, uh, much less a socialist policy in, in this crisis. In reality, I think they're really, there's no, there's no difference between what Bernie Sanders and AOC and the other uh, DSA members in Congress are putting forward then what is the official position of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, and that is actually an ongoing problem where we, I think um, there is an, um, there's a, that's not the first time, there's a general blurring of the lines between the Progressive Caucus and socialists in Congress uh, has led to some really, um, and most glaringly on foreign policy, we saw how Jamal Bowman voted for billions of dollars in uh, US military aid to Israel, and when AOC abstained on the uh, Iron Dome vote. Um, but I think you know the bigger picture is, I think they, um, like a lot of the left, um, internationally has been steamrolled by the ruling class, is manufactured public opinion, um, and are in essence going along with supporting the US and NATO. They frame it in a, in a left wing with left wing framing about they're against Putin, they're against authoritarianism, they're against the oligarchs, but in essence going along with the US and NATO in this conflict where there's no, um, no, no public or explicit opposition to Biden's policy, their support for Biden's brutal sanctions on the Russian people. And I think unlike a socialist approach, a centering of demands for negotiation and diplomacy um, and a reinforcement of the dominant narrative in the West and in the US that this is a clear cut situation of Russian aggression, Putin is uniquely evil, and that something must be done. And I think, of course, the whole, the whole essence of the question, the nub of the question is, what is that something and who decides? Uh, but in the current climate, we have a dynamic where it's under that vague formulation that something must be done that's being uh, mobilized by um, the ruling uh, elite in this country to advance a specific set of imperialist and militaristic measures that are designed to further the interests of US capitalism. Um, and I think the job of socialists, particularly those in Congress who have the highest, plat the biggest platform needs to be able to explicitly, um, obviously first and foremost, oppose the Russian invasion of Ukraine as I, as I did um, at the beginning and explain how we've been consistent against uh, Putin but also to oppose, uh, explicitly separate ourselves from Biden and his policy uh, and his sanctions and to explain in advance that these will rebound against the interests of working people in Russia 
uh, internationally, but also here in the United States um, in terms of uh, the, the sanctions triggering an economic shock in terms of uh, a surge in gas prices and energy prices and how that's gonna tr uh, translate into a general uh, increase in consumer prices, which is, that sounds very modest, but what does that mean in reality? That means a severe cut in living standards. If you have a, a, a significant price increase, a surge of 10% in the next few months, are working class people, are we supposed to pay the, the costs of this crisis? What is Biden's policy for, for dealing with that? Um, I'll, I'll stop um, there. Thank you, Philip. So next I have Grace and I just wanna remind, uh, I'll just reintroduce people for this first um, question. Grayson Lanza is an outgoing co-chair of Orlando DSA and rank and file member of the International Committee. And so we have Grayson next and the question is, um, in addition to or in contrast to what Paul outlined, how would you see this war in, in, um, in Ukraine? And we have Grayson next. Go ahead, Grayson, if you're ready. Thanks, Brian. Uh, appreciate you having me on here. Thanks everyone for putting this together. Thanks r, &R for putting this together. Um, yeah. Um, so I think there are some sentiments that I definitely agree with. Um, I think that obviously the United States and NATO has set the stage for this conflict. Um, I think uh, when we're talking about like, how do I see this conflict? Uh, I, I view this as a continuation uh, of uh, a decades long um, decades long antagonism of uh, Russia by the United States through US uh, imperial uh, aims, right? Uh, very shortly after the dissolution of the USSR, it was made very clear that NATO expansion in the East, um, specifically to Ukraine and Georgia, uh, was untenable. We've, that's, that's not like a new thing. We've known that for, for, for a long time. And I think it's really important to emphasize that because uh, if we want to understand the conflict, we need to understand uh, what actually caused it. So fast forward to 2014, we have Maiden. Some people view it as a revolution. Uh, some people view it as a coup. Uh, personally, I think it's uh, accurate to, to describe it as a coup due to the illegal, the, 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 the illegal measures that were taken to replace the government at the time. And it's not to say that the president at the time, Yankovic, was a, a good guy. Um, but he was illegally replaced, right? Uh, and, and so Maiden was a very violent uh, incident within Ukraine, and it wasn't popularly supported. And I think that gets really overlooked. It wasn't popularly supported. It was mainly a occurrence that had heavy support from far-right actors within Ukraine. Uh, and as a result, post-Maiden, uh, Ukraine very quickly devolved into chaos. And so in the eastern regions, in the Donbass, uh, people were very dissatisfied with, with this uh, and scared. They were very scared because of the rhetoric that was coming out internally within Ukraine uh, by what these people were saying. Uh, we had the Odessa fire where a labor union hall uh, uh, and full of uh, communist members were, were killed. They were set on fire and killed and it was very graphic. This, the whole country saw this. And so uh, you had a, a civil conflict develop, a civil war. It starts in 2014. It's been a war since 2014. The war didn't start a, a week ago. This has been an ongoing war. 14,000 people have died in the Donbass um, region since 2014. So in 2014, yes, Russia did support uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the pro more pro-Russian side of things. But it's important to note that the uh, Ukrainian military at that time uh, was not very successful in defeating the, the, uh, the rebels. And part of the reason was is that people were not supportive of the conflict or the government. And so uh, fast forward, and there's a lot of details I'm skipping over here. You have the Minsk II agreement where all these parties came together. It was internationally mediated and a peace process was proposed and accepted. It was accepted by all the parties. And it included the recognition of the sovereignty of the Donbass by Ukraine, by Russia. And this was not implemented due to U.S. NATO uh, meddling and refusal to enforce this, this uh, with Ukraine. This was not implemented for, for seven to eight years. 
So there's an ongoing civil, there's civil war going on the border of Russia in the Donbass region that's actively killing lots and lots of people. Lots of Ukrainians are dying here. Um, and there's a peace agreement that's on the table that's not being accepted. So we fast forward today. The, the, the invasion is illegal. It's wrong. And there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Uh, it's disastrous. But I, you fast forward and you have a, a new Ukrainian government that was elected on the prospect of peace, right? Uh, uh, Zelensky was overwhelmingly elected to, to implement the peace agreement. That's, he had a mandate. He, he destroyed Poroshenko in, in the election. What happened? He couldn't implement the peace because of the Ukrainian military and security forces refusing to actively engage in a campaign. It's called a campaign against capitulation, where they refuse to stand down in the Donbass to implement the peace. And why could they do that? Due to US and NATO funding and supplying of the conflict. And so Zelensky, even though he's the democratically elected president, has not even had full control over the Ukrainian military state apparatus throughout this conflict and as we've gone through. And so Russia's perception and reaction to this is, is NATO, uh, Ukrainian involvement in NATO is unacceptable. It's a, it's, a, it's a security threat that it cannot accept. The United States is viewed as an existential threat to Russia. And that's understandable. We go, oh, nuclear weapons. It, 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 the United States is a rogue state. It invaded Iraq, it invaded Afghanistan. It's a, it's a se severe threat to sovereignty for any nation that it explicitly outlines as it being opposed to. And so Russia's reactions and ensuing, um, I, I think it's really important to frame that, that the United States has created the spectrum of decisions for Russia to interact with in this conflict, that we set the stage, that NATO set the stage for this. And that's why Ukrainian people are now suffering more than ever, but they've been suffering since 2014. Thank you. Thank you, Grayson. And then we have Neil, who, just to remind comrades, Neil is the editor of The Call, which is the online publication of DSA's Bread and Roses Caucus. And the question again is, um, how would you see the war in Ukraine? Um, go ahead, Neil. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I can, um, yeah. Great. So I want to start by saying thanks to the organizers in the Reform and Revolution Caucus for inviting me today to present the Bread and Roses perspective. Um, I really appreciate all the work your caucus is doing, and I think you've played a really important role in elevating the political debate in DSA, and I think we're really lucky to have you in the organization. Um, and I'm really grateful to be sharing a place on this panel with Paul and Stephanie and Grayson and Phil. Um, but I do want to get right into it because we um, don't have much time, and it is a very serious topic. Um, I think that we have to start by saying uh, the obvious, which is that the invasion of Ukraine is one of the most uh, brazen and unacceptable acts of imperialism in the 21st century. And I think it's fair to say it ranks right up there with the US invasion of Iraq, Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen, and the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestine. And like Paul said, I think the starting point uh, for any sensible socialist perspective on the war therefore it has to be to condemn in the harshest terms the Putin government uh, and its war of choice. Socialists stand unequivocally against imperialism, whether it's of American, Russian, or any other vintage. Uh, and this war is a tragedy that will bring death and destruction, and so the seeds of national hatred. So our solidarity has to be with the Ukrainian and Russian people uh, who will bear its horrible cost. Uh, and of course, I don't, agree with, I don't disagree with anything anyone said about uh, the role of American imperial, imperialism here. Uh, American imperialism played uh, a large part in laying the groundwork for this war. U.S. imperialist maneuvers, including the rapid incorporation of Eastern Europe into NATO and the EU in particular, and the exclusion of Russia from any collective security agreement are partly responsible for ratcheting up tensions. The gradual encirclement of Russia by the U.S. and its allies stoked Russian fears of an eventual in intervention. Uh, recognizing this does not justify Putin's actions, of course, uh, but it does help us think through what it will be needed to reach a lasting resolution to this crisis. Nevertheless, and you know, it has to be said that there's one clear aggressor in the immediate conflict, and that's the government of Vladimir Putin. Uh, that government is backed up by and represents Russia's capitalist class. Um, the driving ambition of Putin's government seems to be to rebuild the Russian empire of the 18th and 19th centuries, and its policies of uh, brutal expansion and authoritarian rule really only help the US and NATO keep their grasp on the vast majority of Europe. Uh, so the question is, what is to be done? 
And here I think real hopes for lasting peace, justice, um, and hopefully democratic socialism lie in the hands of the international working class. It's an old answer, but it's the right answer. Uh, at home in the United States and across the NATO countries, regular people can stop the escalation of military conflict through mass mobilizations uh, and the defeat of our own imperialist governments. We also need, and here I agree with, uh, with Phil, we need a clear anti-war, anti-imperialist line from socialist politicians in Congress. Uh, in Ukraine, working people can resist the invasion by force and through strikes, nonviolent protests and economic action. And most of all in Russia, working people can through their mobilizations, bring the invasion to a halt and ultimately topple the Putin regime. That's also why I think so much rides on the success of the Ukrainian resistance and the Russian anti-war movements. They're the only forces that can stop uh, a new era of inter-imperialist war um, in this present crisis, in addition to the role that the um, anti-war movement plays in the US and NATO countries. Uh, in the present crisis, the Ukrainian resistance needs to mount an opposition to the Russian invasion that's as brave and determined as that raised by the Vietnamese against the US or, the, or by the people of Yugoslavia against Nazi and fascist invaders. They must make war, uh, further wars unthinkable for Russian militarists. At the same time, we need a strong and militant anti-war movement for, uh, in Russia to undermine the Russian war uh, effort. Uh, I do want to end on a final note, which is um, on the situation in Ukraine in general. I think it's obvious that there has to be a struggle inside the Ukrainian resistance between the fascist right and the rest of the resistance movement. Um, there's no guarantee that the fascist anti-fascist side will win. Uh, and obviously our solidarity with the resistance stops if the fascist forces uh, gain hegemony within the resistance. But so far I see no evidence to suggest that they are in charge. Uh, we support the Palestinian resistance despite the presence within that movement of minoritarian right-wing forces. Likewise, today we must support the Ukrainian resistance despite the fact that we abhor and oppose in the strongest terms, the politics of a minority current within that movement. Uh, so to sum up, we must look to three forces for hope in these difficult times. Uh, the mass mobilizations of regular people in the US and the NATO countries against escalation, the resistance in Ukraine uh, and the anti-war movement in Russia. Uh, that's where the hope for a lasting peace uh, can be found. Thank you, Neil. Um, okay, so we're gonna move to the next question. Uh, and just to remind people who, or for people who just arrived is that we have um, three questions. We just finished the first question that we're asking the panelists and each panelist gets five minutes. And then we're gonna open it up for um, open political discussion and debate um, for everybody. But we're gonna move to the next question for the panelists. And that's gonna be, what should be the main demands and the main steps DSA puts forward at this point? Um, and we're gonna shift around the order a little bit. And we're gonna start with Neil and then we're gonna do Philip and Grayson. So Neil, are you ready? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Great, thanks. So as we see it in Bread and Roses, there are really six clear demands that we should be pushing forward at the moment. Uh, first um, and foremost, for those of us living in the US and NATO countries, uh, we must continue to resist the escalation of the conflict into a world war. Uh, that means it's our responsibility in the US and the 29 other member countries of NATO. Uh, it's our responsibility to oppose a NATO-led intervention into the conflict, uh, including a no-fly zone in Ukraine, uh, which NATO seems to have already ruled out. Uh, but there's no guarantee that they will in the future, so we have to be constantly ready to mobilize against that. Um, second, we must support calls, uh, I think, by democratic socialists in Congress to levy he heavy sanctions on the massive fortunes of Russian state leaders and capitalists. Um, doing so effectively will require taking on Wall Street interests who would rather such, for such fortunes remain hidden. Um, at the same time, we have to oppose economic warfare in the form of broad-based sanctions against ordinary Russians and call for the repeal of sanctions already applied against the people of Russia. Third, we, su uh, we support the demand to open the US border to refugees from the Russian invasion, um, as well as other wars and conflicts abroad and to cancel the debt of the Ukrainian government. Uh, fourth, we should offer our solidarity to the Ukrainian and Russian people in both countries. Um, the initial mobilizations by the Russian people in the face of tremendous state repression are really inspiring. Um, we should be calling on DSA, the National Political Committee, the International Committee to offer their strongest terms, uh, strongest uh, solidarity to the armed and nonviolent resistance by the Ukrainian people and to the anti-war movement in Russia. Um, I think the statements that the NPC and the IC put out recently are a really good start for this. 
Um, we should also start to think about calling for demonstrations in the US to show our support for the Ukrainian resistance and the Russian anti-war movement. Uh, right now, I think the left is kind of abdicating in the US its historic role in anchoring anti-war movements. We're abdicating that role to liberals and neocons. Um, and I really think it's important for us to step up and put up a third poll, which is neither pro-Putin nor pro-NATO, which is pro-peace um, and pro uh, a resolution as quickly as possible to this conflict. Um, fifth, we should call on the US, Russia, and Ukraine to return to negotiations to find a diplomatic solution to the conflict. Um, as part of that resolution, uh, we should support the construction of a real and lasting collective security agreement that includes Russia. Um, Russian troops must also withdraw from the Ukrainian territory. Uh, and I think there should be uh, free and open referendums in Crimea and the eastern regions of Ukraine so that the people in those places can decide their own fates, um, what, you know, where they wanna be uh, uh, connected. Uh, and sixth, we have to oppose in the strongest terms, the censorship of dissident views um, on the war by governments and private companies. So no matter how deplorable or objectionable we might find the politics of the television station RT, for example, it absolutely has the right to broadcast its views on platforms like DirecTV and Roku, as well as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, once we give into the logic of censorship by public authorities or private companies, we're really helping pave the way for our own repression. Um, and so we really have to oppose that kind of censorship in the, in the strongest terms. I guess I'll add a seventh point, just because I have a little bit of time. I think it's really important for us on the left to stand together and kind of come together. Um, you know, I have my disagreements with the DSA's international committee, or the majority on the DSA's international committee, for example, but I think the statement that they and the NPC wrote together, the most recent statement is quite good. Um, and I think that there's gonna be a ongoing assault on DSA um, and the left uh, here in the US and all around the world by uh, uh, liberals and conservatives, by the establishment, um, and we have to be prepared to kind of close ranks together uh, to defend against that. So in addition to that, there's really six demands that I think that um, this moment calls for. We've got to oppose escalation by the US and NATO. We have to support sanctions on Russian capitalists, but oppose sanctions on the Russian people. We should open the borders to refugees and cancel the debt of Ukraine. Uh, we need to offer solidarity to the Ukrainian resistance and the Russian anti-war movement. We should be calling for the return to negotiations, the immediate cessation of hostilities, the withdrawal of Russian troops and the holding of referenda in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. And we should be opposing censorship in every form. And I really think those are the, the watchwords, the slogans uh, that uh, we need for the present moment. Thank you, Neil. Um, so then we have Philip Locker up next for five minutes. Go ahead, Philip. Yeah, um, was a lot. Uh, I really agree with the just the last point Neil was just uh, Neil ended on is in the current climate there is DSA is is under a more intense uh, criticism and attack than we've experienced um, generally, and that's definitely part of the whole sort of. Uh, frenzy and and nationalist atmosphere that's being whipped up in the U.S. And we should, you know, um, we may not make, uh, we may lose some support. We may not make um, um, uh, friends with the statement that the NPC put out, where it clearly stood against NATO. But I think that's the DSA's credit, and we have to be willing to stick to our um, to hold our ground on that, um, and not just go which whatever way. Uh, the winds are blowing, whatever is most popular at any time, and I think we will we will reap uh, benefits from it as you know the consequences of 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 uh, the situation become clear to people. Um, you know, one thing I would I think as socialists, though, one thing I would disagree a little bit with the DSA statement, um, and I think um, I'm not sure what we'll, maybe we'll tease it out a little more in the discussion, but. Um, what Neil was saying about diplomacy between, I think we should we should make clear we don't have any trust in diplomacy between the capitalist governments of the U.S., uh, Russia, or Ukraine. Obviously, an end if they were to call a ceasefire and have negotiations and diplomacy, that would be a big step forward. Every, we would of course welcome that, but I think and but I think our focus should be um, to promote. As, as, as Neil was talking about, and I think we all agree, promote the peace protests, 
um, to, uh, that are taking place in Russia to support those, but to call that we need to build an anti-war movement here in the US. Um, and that the, the, the key power of force that can really uh, resolve this crisis in a progressive manner, in a, in a way that's actually sustainable going forward, has to be the, the kind of forces that were talked about of the working class in Ukraine, in Russia, um, and around the world. And that is going to require a, a popular mobilization uh, from below. That should be our emphasis. Um, and as part of that, an anti-war movement um, that agitates to bring all US troops home, to close US military bases abroad, um, and, and again, and to, as a first step to de-escalate, withdraw uh, the NATO battle uh, troops from Eastern Europe and missiles, but overall for uh, an end to NATO. I think that was another thing I would raise is the NPC, just on that, of the importance of the anti-war movement. I thought the NPC statement um, you know, highlighted the Russian peace protests and they highlighted the importance of an anti-war movement, but I thought it was quite passive in terms of how it was talked about. And I think we have to take, DSA has an active role to play. And I think that is very important for the radical left to take that role or else we do face the danger that was talked about that you have um, right-wing populists uh, like Tucker Carlson um, and um, um, uh, owning the political space in the US of opposition to Biden's policy. Um, and we need a, a strong socialist left to, to actively uh, call for the for call and help organize and build uh, protests. And I think DSA, obviously, it has its limitations, but we are, I think, the key force on the radical left in the US today, to, obviously, an alliance and coalition with other forces, but to call to begin mobilizing for protests and building for that. And there's a role for the National uh, Political Committee for chapters, but also for our, pub, our elected representatives. And I think we need to put um, in, a friend, in a constructive and friendly way, but we need to bring some pressure to bear on our elected representatives, the four DSA members in Congress, that they have a role to play in um, the time they're on the media. All that I hear them talking about is there's a need for, for di diplomacy and negotiations. And these are diplomacy and negotiations between what? These are with the, the powers that got us into this mess. I think they should be using their capital, their time in, in the mass media to be calling on um, to be agitating in support of the Russian peace movement, um, but calling for we need to build just like under much more difficult conditions. As it was said, people are willing to risk arrest and, and go out and protest in Russia. We need to go out um, in a far, uh, obviously it's not the most favorable climate right now, but far easier than they face in Russia. And we need to organize protests against the, the actions of our government. Um, and that means criticizing Biden. That means opposing his brutal sanctions on the uh, Russian people and uh, calling to bring US troops home and close down US military bases around the world. And let's use that money to, be, to develop the Green New Deal and renewable energy. Thank you, Philip. Now we have Grayson um, and the question is, what should DSA call for? Go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Um, just wanted to drop a little tidbit. The uh, national statement, about 95% of that was written by the IC. Um, I know we were talking about it a lot, so I thought it was important to note. So uh, the very first demand that we should be having as U.S.-based socialists is that an immediate cessation of all U.S. funding and support and training of uh, conflict within Ukraine. The uh, United States has been se sending arms over to Ukraine uh, since 2014. Got to stop. We have members of Congress. We should be asking them to put proposals forward to, to immediately end all lethal aid into Ukraine, first and foremost, right? That is that is helping fuel the conflict, is killing people, uh, uh, US made, manufactured and funded uh, bombs, bullets, and, and more are killing people in Ukraine. So we need to recognize that and it needs to stop now, now. Secondly, we should be calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, a ceasefire allows for diplomacy. We should be calling for a ceasefire. Um, that is mediated by neutral country, which would not be the United States. The United States, obviously not. We should be advocating for, for uh, neutrality, uh, uh, for a neutral party to be mediating a di diplomatic engagement, um, an immediate ceasefire to end hostilities for the safety of civilians um, and, uh, and everybody involved in the conflict. Um, there, there needs to, the main focus should be how do we immediately end the bloodshed? How do we immediately stop more people from getting hurt, killed, injured, um, 
losing their homes, losing their livelihoods. That should be the main focus. And so, and then as US-based socialists, we should be um, combining our demands for the withdrawal and dissolution of NATO with um, a uh, advocacy for the implementation of the Minsk II uh, Accords, which again, were agreed on uh, since 2015. We should be calling on for guarantees of neutrality of Ukraine. Um, this is for the benefit of all Ukrainians uh, and, and is exactly what will put an end for good to this conflict. Um, I think those demands, that, you know, I, I really want to focus on like kind of your, your immediate and then a, slightly less than immediate um, and then uh, long term diplomatic engagement. Uh, that's what we should be focused on. We're in the United States. Uh, that's what we can demand. We should obviously be supporting um, anti-war protests in, in Russia, um, and we should be opposing the war, and we should be opposing um, the infringement of the sovereignty of Ukrainians. But, uh, you know, the ask is, what are the demands? And so I'm in the United States, and I'm going to demand my congressperson and the people who have the levers of power here, and I'm going to organize for this too. I'm not just going to ask them. I'm gonna, I want to organize for this. Um, the immediate cessation of, of U.S. Uh, uh, hostility. The, the, NATO is already in this conflict. Like I think, I think we need to understand that, right? The United, NATO, United States has been in this conflict. The, the, the bullets, the, the javelins you see being used are manufactured in the United Kingdom and the United States, right? Uh, this is. It's not like a, it, it, what we're at, at this point. What we're just asking for is to not escalate our involvement, right? It's not a new thing. We're not saying, oh, United States, don't get involved. It's already involved. NATO's already involved. So we need to end the, the, the involvement. And that's, that's why we have to focus on those three demands. Uh, again, the focus needs to be what will immediately halt the bloodshed. And that's what will, right? Bullets, bullets going over to Ukraine, you, lethal aid going into Ukraine, it's not going to help anybody. Uh, it's, there is no resistance that we're supporting um, that is going to be using this for, for a good means to an end. Um, and it, it's, it's all we can ask for at this point. Um, so that's what I really wanted to focus on demand wise. And I, I'll see the rest of my time. I don't really have any more when, on, on demands. Okay, thank you panelists. So we have one more uh, question for the comrades and then we'll open it up uh, for political discussion um, from the floor. So the final question, for the panelists is, should we support sanctions against Russian oligarchs or the Russian economy? Should we support sending arms to the Ukrainian resistance? And we're gonna start with uh, where we finished with is Grayson and we'll have Grayson, Neil and Philip. Philip and each one will have five minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, that, that's, that's it, Paul. Um, I want to emphasize this point too. The, the current composition of the Ukrainian state as post maiden is effectively controlled by far right nationalists. And I'm not saying the average Ukrainian is, I'm not saying that even the, 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 the uh, you know, the president Zelensky, he himself is not right. Again, he ran as a pro peace candidate. What I'm saying is that post maiden, the only people who are willing to fight and die for this new state that was being created were far-right nationalists. The Zav Battalion is the most referenced, but there are plenty. And they are officially integrated within the Ukrainian state and intelligence services. There is no Ukrainian resistance that you can fund or support uh, in any way, militarily at least, that is not supporting neo-Nazis and far-right nationalists. And I'm not saying that as like in a political sense, I'm saying that in a realistic analysis of the composition of the Ukrainian state. Post-2014, the only people who were willing to get down and dirty were these people. And they are on the front lines fighting. They are the resistance. They are the resistance. Again, my answer in the first question, when I was talking about the campaign against capitulation, that was, an, that was a campaign by the Ukrainian armed military, the armed services against their own government opposing implementation of peace. They do not want peace. If you are involving yourself in the Ukrainian resistance, you're involving yourself with the funding of neo-Nazis. Even if there are some small groups that are anti-fascist, whatever, 
they do not control the narrative. They do not control, they, they are not materially in power in any way, shape or form. You cannot support in any fashion, a military anything in Ukraine without getting involved with these far right forces. They're who control what's happening on the front lines. They are. And they also control the government. Again, Zelensky can't actually implement peace because, and this has been rumored and discussed and analyzed for years, that he'll get cooed by his own military, the intelligence services. It was reported just, just yesterday that one of the negotiators that was sent into Belarus was, was killed by the Ukrainian uh, security service, the SBU, shot two times in the chest for high treason, for negotiations. They do not want diplomacy. So we should not be in, under any circumstance involving, advocating, discussing military aid to Ukrainian resistance. Now, the only thing that we should be discussing is supporting and helping civilians affected by this conflict. That is the only thing as a socialist you should be demanding. And when it comes to sanctions, it, 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 sanctions, I view just a peg below military aid. That is a lethal escalation of conflict. There is no such thing as targeted sanctions. They do not exist. The United States is the arbiter of what sanctions are, and they implement them. And when they say targeted, they mean targeted in a way that, it, that none of us mean. It's irrelevant what we think when it comes to that. So all sanctions must be opposed. The United States, it's already, it's too late. It's already impl implemented these targeted sanctions. They're targeted to oppress workers in the global South. They, U.S. officials already came out saying that these sanctions are not just going to hurt Ru the Russian people. We're going to hit Venezuela. We're going to hit Cuba. We're going to hit Nicaragua. They're saying this on the radio. They're telling you. They're saying out loud, we're going to make the Russian people scream. We want them to hurt. You calling for sanctions, it, I, I believe this in all sincerity, it is deeply irresponsible to call for sanctions. It is unrealistic and unattainable goal to create sanctions. Again, the United States is who's doing it. The United States is the country that's embargoing Cuba. It's the one that's uh, sanctioning Venezuela, killed 50,000 Venezuelans due to sanctions. We're the ones supporting the war on Yemen. 400,000 Yemenis are dead due to the US, invo US involvement. We have to be realistic about the actual like US state and how it operates and, and our place within it, right? And so no sanctions, no military aid. The, it, 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 the, again, the Ukrainian state as it's composed, the United States has been funding, providing military aid to Ukraine. I, I, the, there was a law, they had to even pass a law in 2008 to stop giving the neo-Nazis so much money in arms. And they still get it, right? So when we're talking about this Ukrainian resistance, I don't know what people are referring to. The average Ukrainian is caught in the middle. They don't want to have anything to do with this. They don't want to, right? And that's why we should be advocating for diplomacy and neutrality, for the safety and sake of all people, in, all civilians involved in this conflict. Otherwise, we're seeing, a, you know, a serious situation, right? The Freedom Fighters, the FSA. And then it turns out it, it, we're, we're funding Al Nusra Front, which is just a Al Qaeda in a trench coat, right? We have to be real. Like this is contemporary events. This is happening right now. And I'm and I'm and I hate to sound like I'm maybe a little hyper, but this is serious. This is very, very, very serious. No military aid to any so-called Ukrainian resistance and absolutely unequivocally no sanctions. No sanctions. Thank you. Thank you, Grayson. So we have Neil up next. And just a reminder, the question is, should we support sanctions against Russian oligarchs or the Russian economy? Should we support sending arms to Ukrainian resistance? Go ahead, Neil. Um, I guess I'll start with respectfully dis disagreeing with Grayson. Um, I think Grayson makes three, I would call them highly contentious claims. Um, first of all, he claims that the current composition of the Ukrainian state is controlled by the far right neo-Nazi forces. Putin also agrees with that. I'm not sure that that's true. Um, second, he claims that uh, the only people fighting and the only people, this is a quote, the only people willing to fight and die are the far right forces post Maidan. Uh, and third, he claims that there's no Ukrainian resistance that's not led by neo-Nazis. We probably are reading different sources. Um, I think that neither of us are experts on the situation in uh, Ukraine, but I, I find those claims to be really contentious and we could probably you know, invoke some other uh, 
scholars of this and, and, and people studying this fight to try to mediate our, contra our, our uh, disagreement on this. But um, I guess we're just, we're just approaching this question from different premises. And I really do, I watch the videos of regular people in Ukraine standing up to Russian tanks. I watch the videos of people preparing Molotov cocktails in the streets. And I find that, I mean, I, I, how can you not be inspired by that? And how can you not feel sympathy with, with that struggle? I mean, and then the idea that all these people are neo-Nazis, Yes, there's a neo-Nazi element in Ukraine that has to be defeated. But anyway, I find that somewhat ludicrous. Um, I'll move on to the question. Uh, so BNR supports the call made by democratic socialists in Congress to impose sanctions on the Russian ruling class very specifically. Uh, this means stuff like seizing yachts, freezing assets. These are good policies to punish the Russian ruling class and to try to force it to compel its government to change course. And of course, I agree with the left, uh, those on the left who say that the US's policy is hypocritical. The US government is willing to punish the Russian ruling class, but it's not willing to punish the Israeli or Saudi ruling classes. Absolutely true. But I do not agree with the implication that for this reason, the left should make no demand on the US government to sanction Russia's capitalists. Instead, the demand should be expanded. Punish the Russian ruling class and the Israeli ruling class and the Saudi ruling class and our own ruling class for that matter. And we, of course, should support a similar course of action by other countries against US capitalists for their support for US imperialism. In the lead up to the Iraq war invasion, I think it would have been uh, fantastic had other countries around the world seized the assets of major uh, US capitalists. Um, let the ruling classes of the world make each other's lives miserable is basically my, my position. Uh, we have no interest in alleviating their pain. Um, on the other hand, the other part of the question is about sending weapons to Ukraine. I wanna be very clear that Bread and Roses has not discussed this question. Um, and so there isn't a clear position on that from the caucus. So I'm just gonna speak for myself. Um, and what I have to say is not very conclusive. I mean, I don't have a clear position yet myself. Um, I can see arguments on both sides. And for me, this is really a question of strategy, uh, not of principle. Um, on the one hand, I agree with those who say that the sale of arms to the Ukrainian military risks escalating the conflict with Russia. Um, that's obviously something we wanna avoid and something we have to consider. Um, on the other hand, I don't see how you can support the right of the Ukrainian resistance to fight back while also arguing that an embargo should be placed on the sale of weapons to resistance fighters. Uh, the resistance needs arms to defend itself, otherwise it will fall quickly uh, to the Russian army. And I think that's the basic uh, difficulty that we're in in this situation. Um, so I'm not gonna say much more. I, I don't have a clear view of myself on this question. Um, I, like I said, I don't think it's a question of principle. Imperialists absolutely have their own intentions and providing aid to a resistance movement. Um, but resistance movements have in the past and they can in the future uh, make use of inter-imperial rivalries for their own purposes. Uh, the key questions for further discussion in my mind are what kind of weapons can the arms trade uh, with Ukraine continue without leading to a world war? And will the sale of weapons only strengthen the hand of the fascist elements inside the Ukrainian resistance? I think those are real questions that we have to consider and grapple with. Um, and they deserve a lot more analysis and debate uh, as we try to figure out these difficult questions. Thank you, Neil. Do we have Philip up next? Go ahead, Philip. Um, I'm gonna st start, I agree. One of the things I think Grayson said um, is the average Ukrainian is caught in the middle. They don't want anything to do with this. Um, and I, 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 I agree with Neil's uh, point that I, I don't think that's a very, that's not my assessment of the situation. I think the vast majority of, and there's a, there's a strong division in Ukraine between the Russian, uh, the ethnic Russians and Russian speakers who are minority and the Ukrainian uh, uh, speaking uh, the ethnic majority. But speaking of the Ukrainian majority, I think there's a massive um, overwhelming um, uh, opposition to the Russian invasion and a ferocious um, uh, sentiment to resist. And I think, I think Putin has, has made an enormous mistake if he thinks he can occupy, he may military, like the US, he may militarily succeed in taking Ukraine like the US did in Iraq, but I think he will face an even greater, more ferocious resistance um, that, will be, that will go on and on and will really sap um, his power over time. Um, and it will definitely be well-funded uh, and equipped by, by the West. I don't think we have any doubt about that. Um, I think that's in context, what's, what should we as socialists say? Um, but just, I mean, just first, I also agree that that resistance um, is inspiring for all, I think for, should be inspiring for us and for activists around the world 
the resistance we're seeing of the, have a mass popular resistance, how ordinary people are taking up arms, how ordinary people are confronting Russian tanks, appealing to Russian soldiers to desert. Um, I think those are, are absolutely correct. Um, and we should support uh, a, a Ukrainian armed and unarmed resistance. Now, I just, but to go into that a little more, I mean, just first on the question of sanctions, I think um, as, as internationalists, we should strongly oppose the sanctions regime being, uh, being carried out by the US and other Western powers on Russia. Um, and I think there's a nuance on some of the, the more targeted things Neil talked about, but let's, be, let's not kid ourselves. That's, that's not the, the main character of the sanctions that are being imposed. The main character of the sanctions being imposed are, are quite um, severe sanctions on the Russian economy that are hitting first and foremost, the working people and middle class of Russia the hardest. That's the overwhelming uh, reality of the sanctions being carried out. So I think that has to be our starting point. What do we have to say about the, the thrust of US uh, and European sanctions which are mean an enormous fall in living standards for regular people. And it's a measure, I think we need to be clear headed. It's a measure of war, these sanctions. Um, and they're, say, they're saying the uh, NATO and uh, various political leaders in the West are openly saying that the Biden administration tries to tone that down, but it is a means of, of warfare. Um, and it's part of an escalator, escalatory ladder that runs the risk of a much more serious, larger conflict. Do we really think that Putin's not gonna take countermeasures? If the, US, if the West continues with these severe sanctions to cripple the Russian economy, he has tools at his disposal in terms of cyber attacks on the West and other, and other tools. If he does that, we have to think through what's going to be the consequences. There will be an enormous upsurge of nationalism, war frenzy, and, and expansion of military spending in the, in the US and in Europe. So I think we have to take a step back and say you can't, well, just one, one other thing is what are the cons economic consequences of the sanctions? This, the economic consequences leave aside the impact on the Russian people, but in terms of uh, working, working people here in the US, we are gonna see a major shock in terms of gas prices, energy prices, and consumer prices generally. That is raw, there's gonna be a wave of popular discontent around that. Unless the left gets out in front of that, unless the left starts mobilizing against that inflation, which is a consequence of Biden's sanctions, we are giving an open field for right-wing populists uh, to run, to really uh, uh, exploit that. We need to be out front calling for an anti-corporate program to deal with inflation of, um, of energy subsidies to working class and, and, and poor middle-class people for cracking down on the price gouging of corporate America and taking the big energy companies into public ownership and rapidly retooling them for renewable energy. Um, so just the last thing I'll just say is on, I'm running, um, the issue of targeted, if they're truly targeted sanctions, like seasonally yachts and luxury items of Russian oligarchs in the West, I don't see how we can oppose that. Um, absolute, I, I agree, we, we, can support, we, we don't oppose that, but I think we need to point out that uh, we have to, um, I think our job is to expand that into seizing the assets of the US oligarchs and billionaires, rather than it just being a measure, an anti, a measure of US imperialism against their, their rival. And I think the main, the last thing I'll say is I think the main focus though is not on those targeted sanctions, which I think too much of the left is focusing on, focusing on in a climate where there's a tidal wave of calls for sanctions, but to shout stop, that this is a disastrous policy what Biden is carrying out that's gonna lead to a larger war and it's gonna have severe economic consequences for working people here at home. Thank you, Philip. Um, I want to, so we're now we're finished with the initial questions for the panelists and we'll move into the, the floor discussion. And I want, before I move on, I just want to thank, warmly thank Grayson, Neil, Philip, Paul, and Stephanie all for uh, speaking today. I mean, this is a very intense um, situation. This is war, emotions run high, obviously, it's totally um, appropriate. But I think for us here today, like um, we want to have a, a camaraderie uh, political discussion where we refrain from dipping too much into that, um, into the emotional tempest that is uh, war. Uh, and we try to approach these things 
politically and re recognize that we're, um, we might have differences of view and, uh, um, and coming at it from different angles, but uh, we're all in this together in the sense that we wanna build a massive anti-war movement, we wanna build a mass massive socialist movement, we wanna put an end to imperialist war and aggression and violence. And that's our starting point. Um, but we also want to have clarity as socialists about what is the way forward for the international working class. And uh, I feel like this is the space where we can have calm, camaraderie debates and discussion about what is the way forward for the socialist movement and the anti-war movement in this very um, trying times. So with that, I want to move into um, the open discussion period. And we only have, you know, currently set aside 45 minutes for this. So that comes down to be roughly, you know, like, you know, 15 contributions at three minutes each. So let's, I'll try to, I'll make sure to keep us on, on track and on, uh, on schedule, but let's try to, keep, let's keep our contributions to three minutes. And I'm, uh, I'm also, I'm managing the time and the stack. So just uh, bear with me as I, as I do this. And also, if you want to speak, just directly message me, Brian Watson. I don't know if this is Watson, but uh, I think it does. Brian Watson as uh, host, co-host, whatever it says there, just text me directly, just stack. Um, okay, so I have two people on stack, three people, I'm sorry. So we'll start with, sorry, my vision's not greatest here. Ron Joseph is first. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, Thank you, Brian. Um, and I want to say, you know, thank you to all the panelists for uh, speaking today and for uh, r, r for hosting this event. Um, I guess, uh, you know, my question and sort of comment would be, you know, for example, in Afghanistan, we saw how the U.S. support for the Mujahideen in the 80s uh, eventually led to local dynamics shaping in such a way that Taliban formed, who then hosted the Al-Qaeda, and, you know, 9-11 uh, happened and things happened, uh, you know, and we got the whole global war on terror. And looking into European history, we, you know, we also saw how German soldiers in World War II, oh, sorry, World War One, uh, came back, you know, crushed the communist uprising, killed Lo Rosa Luxemburg, and would later form the um, a strong uh, element of the Nazi regime. And in the Spanish context, we saw how Spanish soldiers and troops fighting in the African colonies again were uh, flew flown back into Spain and helped crush the uh, left forces in the Spanish Civil War. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is because in this context, I'm seeing reports, you know, besides the far right elements, which are already part of the Ukrainian military, sure, we can talk a lot about the, you know, the composition or power of those groups, but the fact is they are an element um, of the military and the government on the ground. Um, and I'm also seeing reports about foreign fighters, uh, you know, far right folks and, veterans um, from the West, including the U.S., going into Ukraine. And I guess my concern and question is, how would um, mi any military aid and support for resistance, um, you know, not result in blowback for us, um, you know, for the left and marginalized groups in the U.S. and other parts of the West when these uh, forces eventually come return to these countries and, you know, become part of the existing um, rejoin the existing far right networks and become like shock troops for the right um, in these countries, um, especially with their, um, you know, amplified by the fact that these folks, uh, foreign fighters, would have had battlefield experience and experience, you know, using armaments and so on. While the left, you know, uh, we're still um, trying to organize um, in our, our own local context. So I guess that's a concern I wanted to bring up. Thanks, Ron. Where are you from, Ron? Are you a member um, of ESA as well? Yeah, I'm calling in from Philadelphia. Great. Um, and if if everybody can introduce yourself, maybe just say where you're at. And if you're a member of DSA, that'd be great. Okay, so I have next is Tom M. Hey, comrades. Tom here, Phoenix DSA, rank and file member. If I'm out of breath, I just finished a workout, so still coming down from that. Um, but what was just mentioned is something that I'll touch on briefly, and also in contrast to Phil and Neil's point about providing material, mainly military support for Ukraine's resistance. Uh, similar to what Ron was mentioning, 
exogenous forces um, exerting their influence, whether it's globally or regionally, it radicalizes populations and more often than not, it radicalizes the far right, whether they're secular or non-secular, because they're the easiest to influence, they're the easiest to provoke to violence, and they also help maintain uh, control of those uh, through those exogenous forces um, in a proxy-like, excuse me, proxy-like fashion. So um, I would just want to start off by agreeing with Ron, disagreeing with Neon Phillips, Phillips' point about uh, providing material support, uh, mainly military aid, especially since it also flies in the face of an anti-war position and only serves military capital. Um, and on a related note, I, I'm of the mind that the political moment has passed, at least currently, to ask for the disbandment or the the leaving of NATO, especially by the U.S. The Russian invasion has kind of forced the hand of the left to uh, use that as like a principled stance. Not to say that we shouldn't have that as a penultimate goal, but there's more specific things to focus on that heighten contradictions more than asking the U.S. to leave NATO, especially since it can be easy, uh, easily opportunistically or recuperated by different uh, different empires, mainly the the Russian and U.S. empire, we could easily be falling into the same defenses and internationalist cliches that created the second internationalist uh, schism. So those specific demands would be, for instance, the U.N. charter, which uh, both Putin and the U.S. throw mud at each other and holding each other accountable for their own hypocrisies and contradictions. Uh, the U.N. charter has been rebuked several times by the U.S. with its Belgrade invasion and also its Iraq and Afghanistan invasion. It did not adhere to the UN Charter, similar to how Putin did not adhere to the UN Charter for this. The UN Charter, in its spirit and its letter, is, I think, um, pretty airtight and is also uh, promotes an international anti war movement and international solidarity. And the contradictions there are undeniable on any regional or global empire's um, agenda, whether it's you know past or present. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there to point out those contradictions. I think we should focus on that. Uh, secondly, in the U.S., we should ask for the specific removal of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Ever since that was put in, mainly due to the shock doctrine from the war on terrorism, the executive branch has unilateral power to use military force without Congress's approval. Uh, that's fucked up. We should focus on that internally. By far, it's going to um, it's going to connect with Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Belgrade, and other U.S. contradictions, and it's more amiable to the general consciousness of an American other than leaving NATO, which is going to be opportunistically called, you know, pro-Putin, because like I mentioned, our, our hand has been forced in the situation. Uh, thirdly, this has also been mentioned, is removing all IMF debt. Uh, it's a soft power apparatus. It's used to promote political and economic uh, power within countries and remove uh, self-determination from countries that are fallen in an entrapment to it. Um, lastly, specifically, also the sanctions are collective punishment and our war crimes, uh, full stop, um, and according to the Hog and also the UN Charter. The war crimes, another opportunity for contradictions that are more specific. Any sanctions against the Russian people, especially by the economic infrastructure by SWIFT and Visa, are going to hurt the Russian working class. It's going to create a schism between the Russian working class and any international anti war movement. We need to promote international anti war solidarity with them and ask that those sanctions that affect them be removed and don't target them. And um, see what else I got here. Yeah, and then lastly, for uh, any any further rhetoric that we should use, we are going to have to be uh, careful of, you know, calling each other out on, you know, being uh, expressly pro-U.S. and pro-Russian. Uh, I think whenever two empires clashed, there's going to be a lot of hypocritical uh, rhetoric that they're going to they're going to throw around. And there's going to be half truths. Um, mainly, this is in response to you know the the back and forth about the character, political or social character of the Ukrainian government or its people. Uh, so I just want comrades to be aware of that. And um, yeah, I think that's it for me. I see the rest of my time. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. So we have. Oh, sorry, I'm on the right. Um, um, Glee, or is that right? G L Y is next. Fly. Is that me? G L Y N. Yes. 
So uh, I'm, I'm Glenn. I'm from uh, Wales in the, in the UK. Um, so first of all, I'd want to thank the uh, Human Revolution for all in this discussion. I think it's been um, quite a balanced and serious discussion um, on there. I think in, in recent years, the, uh, in the, the light of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, uh, the uh, growing climate movement, and, and I could go on and give various other examples, there's been a tendency to see a uh, shift to, to the left in society. Um, and there is truth in that. But I think uh, the, the outbreak of war in Ukraine has shown the limitations of that where essentially, even amongst many of the most uh, uh, thought-inducing sections of society, there, there's been a lining up between two imperialist camps. Um, and I think that's, that's important to highlight the, where we are in terms of the class forces in society, that that, that so easily seems to be the, the automatic point of divergence. So I think that the key Thing really for, for us on the left to discuss is what can we put forward in terms of demands not, not only which help in the situation in Ukraine but can also raise that class consciousness and bring that element into it so I thought for example the um, demands that uh, Paul raised in his introduction were, were very very good um, but there's one suggestion I would make to tweak that so where he says that we should put in a demand for the immediate um, opening of the borders for all refugees from Ukraine, I think we should um, make the point that we should allow the immediate opening of the borders for refugees from all war zones. Um, now, I don't think anyone would disagree with that, but I think it's a very practical political point from that as well, because that opens up the discussion of why it's OK for Saudi Arabia and NATO allies to bomb Yemen repeatedly. Um, this, this puts it in its true context, that this is an interperialist rivalry and some wars are okay and some wars are not. Um, so I think that helps advance the, 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 um, the, the class nature of the of this view. I think all the points made about sanctions and, and that they're a, a tool of uh, inter, interperialist rivalry is absolutely spot on and I think it's, clear that whatever sanctions you put in place, it will be ordinary people who, who suffer the most. But I think there's a, another side to it, a much more devious side to it as well, which is the jingoistic nature uh, of, of sanctions as well. So there's, I'll give one example, there's a supermarket in, or in fact, several supermarkets they followed suit after each other have now renamed Chicken Kiev's uh, and the spelling of it to the Ukrainian spelling. And of course that is, just you can't describe that as anything but anti-Russian maneuvers uh, um, rather than anything else. Um, but I think we also have to um, turn the, the tables in other areas as well. So, for example, in, in the British media and, and probably the same everywhere, there's been condemnation of the attacks on uh, and the arrests of Russian anti-war protesters, uh, rightfully so. But currently in Britain, there's a police, police and crime bill going through Parliament which would mean that if, the, if those protests took place in Britain, then we would also be arrested for the same thing. And I think the hypocrisy of that needs to be pointed out um, as well. And I'll, I'll finish on this, uh, just asking um, more of a question really, which I don't know the answer to, and I'd love an answer for it, but I completely understand if no one has got an answer for it, but it's something that on the left we need to grapple with, is that we can quite clearly and correctly point out the, 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 the problems of working with NATO, and there is no good solution for, for ordinary working class people in Ukraine at the moment. It's either going to end with uh, Russian occupation or a, essentially a puppet regime of NATO uh, taking power. There, uh, unfortunately, there, um, there is no workers' organization in Ukraine as a third pole of attraction. So the question is, whilst we can oppose both imperialist camps, and we can put forward de demands for um, re refugees and an end to the war. In what that's really going against the stream of society at the moment, which sanctions are uh, are, are widely supported because um, it's something that can be done, uh, seen by many. So, in practical terms, what is it that we can do beyond the demands that can genuinely help 
Ukrainian people in it in a crisis position, which I, I have no idea where to begin on that. And I just apologize because I know I've gone over on the time and we're short for the time, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Sorry, I got your uh, name wrong there. Um, okay. And also, if uh, comrades can keep an eye on the chat screen, I'll be sending you um, your time and so you're aware of where you're at on that. Um, so we have next is Gerard, then um, and then Brandon Madsen. Go ahead, Gerard. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is uh, Gerard. I'm a member of New York City, uh, the New York City chapter of the TSA and the International Committee. Uh, I'm uh, Eastern European, born and raised in Romania. I, I helped write the original International Committee statement as well as the new DSA statement. Um, and I've been involved in the International Committee with like, you know, facilitating and helping and kind of uh, uh, all of the background and sources and, and stuff that we've been discussing and trying to put together the statements and the responses and analyzing the situation and everything. So I've been over the past few weeks involved with this process in DSA and trying to see how we can uh, best help and how we should relate to, to all of this and respond. Um, so I just wanted to give a couple of uh, thoughts on, on this. I think that um, it's, I think it's crucial right now as socialists in the US to, to orient ourselves um, in, in regards to like what we're seeing as the mainstream rhetoric on, on this topic. Um, right now we're seeing like, there's like large rallies out there of people like just calling for no fly zones, uh, which is basically just calling for starting a new world war. Uh, this is like a, a serious um, like thing that we, we really have to like push back on, on that kind of stuff, which is unfortunately, it seems through recent polling that a lot of people are not aware of maybe what a no fly zone is and they're not aware of how these sorts of calls are uh, completely counterproductive to de-escalating the situation. Uh, we're also seeing major calls for sanctions and implemented um, various types of implemented sanctions that have already started to severely impact the Russian economy and which only hurt working class people in Russia um, and the region. Um, and this is coupled with serious jingoism and um, increased um, you know, uh, negative rhetoric against uh, Russians in, in the US, which we have to push back on. Um, again, this is only going to further, um, uh, it's not gonna do anything to deescalate the situation. Um, we're also seeing continued arms uh, shipments to Ukraine. Uh, just yesterday, Blinken was in Moldova and he had basically said that NATO countries now have a green light to send uh, fighter jets to Ukraine. Um, the U.S. had continued to send hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons just uh, over the past month to Ukraine. Since uh, 2014, some $3 billion of weapons sales uh, by the U.S. have been funneled into Ukraine. And over the past decades, uh, maybe one of the things that people have not realized about the situation in regards to NATO is that uh, while Ukraine is not a member of NATO, they have been over the past, uh, you know, years uh, directly involved with U.S. Uh, and NATO troop presence in Ukraine, uh, facilitating training, uh, running joint military operations and bases, uh, stationing weapons, um, and as well as continuing to, uh, you know, de uh, continuing to escalate the, the overall conflict in, in the region in we saw as soon as as in the lead up to the invasion, they basically like all like immediately like ran out of Ukraine, uh, obviously. So the sort of rhetoric that that like NATO um, provides or, or that the US provides, you know, uh, security to countries clearly is completely debunked in, in what has happened in Ukraine. Um, so I think we can uh, all agree on, on, on that and what NATO's role has been has been in this. And I think We've seen just the sort of uh, ridiculous uh, response to the a very, um, you know, uncontroversial statement by DSA for, through all of these mainstream media and, and various like liberal and, and right wing uh, sources and people. I think we have to be unified in like 
uh, pushing back on that. And I think we should not overestimate or underestimate like uh, our class enemies um, abilities to use this against us in this moment. And we have to be principled and not shy away from educating people on the role of the US and NATO in all of this. I think people are saying it's not the time to do this right now, but this is in fact the time when people are talking about NATO and we should be clear about the history of NATO and we should be clear about how left-wing parties in Europe are virtually all anti-NATO. And in fact, many of them have put out statements criticizing NATO and the role of, that NATO has played in, in the lead up to this crisis. Um, so I think we should um, you know, be aware of all this. And I think we should be um, aware of how this conflict is seeming to, uh, is trying, like the US is trying to really draw out this conflict. Uh, it's, I think it's a very dangerous situation for Ukraine. I have relatives and friends in Ukraine and the region. Um, and I think that this, this could potentially without de-escalation, uh, you know, uh, turn into a much worse conflict. And we've already seen how even like food prices and are now in like in places like Yemen and Afghanistan are like severely being, uh, um, like impacted by this conflict. And we have to, to, to really be careful about amplifying and legitimizing rhetoric that like legitimizes, uh, the role of the U S as any sort of arbiter of like, uh, you know, like a just uh, rational imperial project in, in, in all of this, because the U.S. has its own imperialist interests and Please wrap it, it will not, um, yeah, uh, it, you know, it's not going to do what's right in this conflict and we should, we should not kid ourselves otherwise. Thank you, Gerard. So we have Brandon next. Yeah, hi, my name's Brandon Madsen. I'm a member of Reform and Revolution Caucus of DSA based in Portland, Oregon. And uh, yeah, I wanted to go back to something that I believe Paul said at the very beginning about how there's sort of at least two different layers to this situation where you have the inter-imperialist conflict between, the, um, between Russia and its allies and the United States and its allies. Um, and that's one dimension to deal with here. And then there's sort of the, the imperial invasion by Russia of Ukraine. Um, and that sort of has, has its own dynamics and these things are happening on top of each other and interacting. And that, that's, I think, a framework that we need to, to keep in mind that it's not simply one or the other, but that both are true at the same time. And so I think obviously based on being in the US, which is one of the major imperialist powers involved here, our emphasis first and foremost uh, in our actions and demands need to be on, uh, you know, hold, keeping in check, holding back to whatever extent we can our own imperialists from doing their thing. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with opposing sanctions. Sanctions are bad. Oppose the no-fly zone. The no-fly zone is bad. Um, oppose sending arms. Um, because that, yeah, again, even though the resistance uh, needs and deserves arms, in, in reality, if the US sends arms, it's going to send it to its allied government um, in the Ukraine, a government which we should not support. Um, and I think that, um, and just to be clear, I, I've i heard some people group uh, sort of assume Philip was saying something about sending arms, that was not my understanding. I, my understanding was he was saying the resistance is is good, uh, but did not actually get to the arms question, um, that we, we should support the resistance on the ground in the Ukraine of regular people, that that's genuine. Um, but yeah, the arms is, is a somewhat separate question. And I think the other thing to keep in mind with with the arms is that when if you're sending it to Ukraine, you're not only sending it, sending them to Ukraine, the uh, imperially dominated force in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, you are also sending arms to the Ukrainian government, aka the, the repressive force in the Donbas, um, which I think that like those same weapons are not just going to be set aside if the, if the Ukrainian current Ukrainian government is triumphant, it's going to use those same weapons to continue carrying out um, repression in the uh, Donbas region, um, which we should oppose and we should be in favor of uh, self-determination for all peoples in both countries. And so I think, um, 
you know, in, in short, I think we can't put any faith in the US and NATO forces as being any part of the solution to this, um, that uh, anything they do is going to be colored by their imperialist character and that, uh, and that there's going to be a momentum to this situation and our role is primarily to stop the momentum of the current situation, not to, um, to uh, you know, try and suggest hypotheticals that some hypothetical better US government might do if it were intervening. I think the primary thing is we need to stop the actual US government and its actual intervention. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Now we got Bobby up next. Hey, thanks. Um, so earlier, Grayson made a point that we should oppose sending arms to uh, Ukraine because supporting any Ukrainian military necessarily means supporting like neo-Nazi and far-right reactionaries. Um, and the counter that I heard to that was that not every person fighting is a neo-Nazi. And these points can both be true at the same time. Um, I understood Grayson to be talking about the role or structure of the Ukrainian military and militias, which are heavily involved, like heavily um, infested with far right re reactionaries, racists, and neo Nazis. And that's tied to the Ukrainian state, which is a, uh, like a repressive state. But in the same way that uh, police play a reactionary and racist role in America without each individual cop being a white supremacist or an explicit fascist, it's important to differentiate these people that are fighting on the ground from the structures of the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian state. Where does that leave us though? Like practically, what does that mean for us and what should we support? I don't think that we have a straightforward way to get aid or support or arms to the just the good ones, just the people that are not the re reactionary racists. Um, if we send aid, it's going to the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian state's just giving it to whoever's fighting, which is going to include those neo-Nazis uh, that are like, have a significant presence in Ukraine. So like, I think that we should really be careful about who we're talking about, the role that they play, what kind of power they hold, where they stand in terms of the structure of the state and the capitalist system. Um, and really try to, to be careful when we're talking about these things to actually address the points that each other are making so we can have the most productive possible conversation. And I see the rest of my time. Thank you, Bobby. We have Luke up next. And if you can uh, introduce yourself too, that'd be helpful. Uh, okay, that's fine. Luke is up Luke. next. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm Columbus, Ohio, uh, involved with the Reform and Revolution Caucus here. Um, pronouns are he, him. Uh, just a couple quick points that I picked out, and actually, Bobby did a great job of uh, bringing these up as well. Uh, whether or not how much power Ukrainian neo-Nazis have within the Zelensky government has nothing to do with whether or not sanctions are appropriate, which they aren't. Keeping in mind the decades of pressure from the IMF, the resistance to those measures, the subsequent coup in 2014, and the legalized assistance to nationalist fascist militants within Ukraine in 2016, from the West, you know, in the fog of war, it is nearly impossible to estimate to what extent Ukrainian ultra-nationalist fascists fascists are involved in the Zelensky government. There is collaboration, there has to be, but comrades on the ground are reporting that claiming the whole of Ukrainian political power is captured or an extension of the Azov militants and their allies is not helpful and is not accurate. Um, I also heard the assertion that inflation is an extension of the, exist, the existing Biden sanctions. I think that that's deeply questionable. Uh, by my estimation, the international bourgeoisie is attacking the national bourgeoisie within Russia. Sanctions will hurt the Ukrainian and Russian working class, and by extension, the international working class. Inflation is being pushed onto the people of the U.S., just as sanctions will be pushed upon the working people of Russia, and the ultra-capitalist class is reporting record profits. It seems to me that the Biden admin is using this conflict as a convenient cover for the American and international capitalist class, getting its beak wet at the expense of working people. And uh, that's, my, that's my time. Thank you, Luke. We have 
Kip next. Go ahead, Kip. Kip, if you're there. Okay, we'll come back to Kip, to Kip. Is Robert H, is Robert Hughes on the call? I think I saw him drop off. Maybe he came back on, I'm not sure. Robert Hughes, are you on the call? I am now, I actually, I actually accidentally pushed the wrong damn button. <laughs> okay, all right, so, yeah. well, you're up. Uh, thank you, so I'll be very, very brief. So folks who have been advocating the, the leaving of NATO from my position and in my opinion, they, we need to do a better job of articulating a vision as to what would leaving NATO look like, the proper conditions for leaving and the, and the, and the dissolution of NATO, for example, I know uh, uh, people like Bernie Sanders and, and other folks have articulated a vision as to what would Medicare for all look like? What would, what, what, what would be like having a different healthcare system than what we have now? Then it, and, and depending on where you fall in the uh, either for police uh, abolition or defunding the police, I know what a vision of, of having a, a different police force or different you know, force would look like. From my perspective, no one has done a, a good job in articulating a vision. What will leaving NATO look like? What would what would our defensive capacity look like? What would a world without NATO look like? So from my point, that needs to be people need to do a better job in articulating a vision. It's not enough for us to say, oh, just leave NATO and uh, as if NATO is going to magically disappear. It's not going to disappear. It may be, maybe it, it would take on another form. So that's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. And where are you from, Robert? Oh, I'm sorry. I am. Um, my name is Robert Hughes. See him from Indianapolis, Indiana. Great. Glad you're here. Um, okay. So then is Kip on the call? You'd be next there, Kip. Okay, uh, we'll jump to Stefan then. Stefan, are you ready? I am. Hi, my name is uh, Stefan Kimmerle. I'm a member of Reform and Revolution and a co convener of Seattle DSA's district group in District 2. I, I really want to thank every comment, all comments who spoke here, and I appreciate this debate very much. Um, I think that's important for us to hear the different voices in DSA and have an exchange. Uh, I think that's the basis for us to stand together what we need in this time of war. I would like to highlight the problem that the loudest voices who spoke in the last years for this new socialist left in the US, they are now not promoting a socialist pos position regarding this war in the Ukraine. Bernie Sanders said in a short video, very early on when the war started, quote, now is the time to maintain unity with our allies and impose severe sanctions on Vladimir Putin and his government, severe sanctions. These moves should not only isolate the Russian economy and so he goes on, but it's not just sanctions against Putin, what he says first, hitting the Russian economy hard. So that means he wants to ally with NATO and de facto, he's allying with the Biden administration, with a policy of escalation and other expansion. And that is also the main line of DSA members in Congress. They follow a liberal line, Putin is the evil, and then there is support for NATO, or at least there's silence about NATO at this crucial point of time. And there is silence about the Democratic Party's historical and current politics. And this is where I feel like I'm proud to be a member of DSA with a statement that immediately earned the wrath of uh, Mike Quinn, the White House Rapid Response Director on Twitter, who called the NPC and IC statement shameful and dare to stand clearly, reaffirm our position to uh, disband NATO. I think that was strong and clear and fast. Very welcome. I just also think that given how things develop, 
we need to build on that statement. I think we need to be clear that we stand against Biden's politics. I think there needs to be a clear line between socialist and liberal politics and then to be a, a vocal politic of the dominant policies of the Democratic Party. I think we need to also actively promote an active role of the working class in this resistance. And that's why I feel also that the front loading in this statement, it's a short statement by the NBC, but the front loading of diplomacy is not super helpful in pointing in the right direction. I think many working people have hopes in diplomacy. If there's any chance to solve this conflict by talks, great. But is there? I mean, if the NPC means what it says at the end of its statement that you're confronted with quote, militarism, imperialism, and war, it's clear that the simple call to diplomacy is not sufficient. I think we all know that. But then I think it's clear that the willingness of the ruling elites in Russia, in the Ukraine, and in the US to actually engage, engage what ordinary people would understand as diplomacy, that needs to be enforced by working class mobilization. That's where I think our biggest hopes in the Ukraine are those forces who not only fight the Russian invasion, but oppose the discrimination and war against the Russian speaking minority in the Donbass region. And therefore those hopes clearly cannot be placed in the US backed regime that engages in those practices. My main problem is the Ukrainian government I don't want to downplay the role of fascists, but my main problem is that they are allied with NATO and this NATO policy of uh, expansion of NATO power and discrimination against the minority. I think that next to the working class resistance in Ukraine against invasion, our best hope to slow down and help Putin's greater Russian ambitions is the power based on, uh, is, the, um, is, is uh, what develops in the Russian anti-war movement. And our biggest hope to, to fight the aggressive NATO expansion in this situation is to build here in the US an active anti-war force where we do not call on diplomacy from the Biden administration, from the imperialist US or anything else like that, like that but build our power bottom up. Thank you, Stefan. We have just, well, maybe three more depending on if Kip is here, but two to three more speakers, and then we'll move to sum up uh, of the panelists. Kip, are you on the call? Okay, so we're gonna move to um, Alex S next and then Ashton. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I should, yeah, to start by introducing myself, uh, I'm Alex, I go by they, them pronouns. I'm a member of Reform and Revolution in Phoenix DSA. Uh, I wanted to start by saying I agree with uh, Brandon um, about opposing the sending of arms uh, to Ukraine in part because we can't fully support the Ukrainian regime. Uh, of course, it has far right elements and, but also it's repression of Russian speakers in the Eastern regions um, because you know, we, we should also be in support and solidarity with the Ukrainian people fighting off an invasion, uh, but we have to support the right to self-determination consistently. So that means both Ukrainians in general and also for the oppressed minority of the Russian speaking population. And it's the fact that they uh, haven't been respecting that right to self-determination that gives Putin some degree of cover by you know pretending he's coming in, you know, in a humanitarian sense in order to protect that right. Um, so, you know, if you take that away, that that does a lot towards uh, decreasing the morale of the Russian troops and increasing the hand uh, of the Russian peace movement. Um, so I, I think that's really important to be putting on our, um, you know, in our messaging. Um, and I hope the a Ukrainian movement will take that up. Um, but most importantly, the way that we, you know, can do this uh, solidarity is by building a strong working class resistance in general to an imperialist war. We can uh, support the Russian anti-war movement, and then in the U.S., we support the anti-war movement here. The biggest problem in the U.S. is the absence of a socialist position or a visible one. If Bernie and the squad won't do it, the DSA has to do it, and otherwise there's no potential for a socialist solution to the issue. If we need to firmly call for the disbanding of NATO, in addition to immediately achievable demands like calling for NATO troops and missiles out of Eastern Europe, which is a little bit of a segue in between, um, and we can do this while participating in and building any anti-war movement in the US more broadly, which will undoubtedly at least begin as a vastly liberal movement dominated by you know, liberal ideas. 
Uh, but if we really believe in our own politics, we need to do what we can to spread them. Uh, there can't be a permanent peace under capitalism, of course, but there, all, uh, there especially can't be a stable lasting peace with the expansion or even existence of NATO in combination with the inevitably escalating tensions between imperialist powers as capitalism fails to maintain a stable regime of accumulation. So this is only going to become more important to make our point as time goes on. I would agree with Stefan and what others have said about the problems for simply uh, with simply calling for diplomacy, um, because people will have to understand that our hope for peace is a powerful working class and international anti-war movement. It, you know, that's the only where, uh, way we can actually achieve this in a lasting way. And it's great what DSA has already done in standing against the tide of propaganda, but we will also need to more clearly separate our position from that of the progressives or that of left representatives who are collapsing into the progressive position. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. And then we're wrapping up with Ashton. Go ahead, Ashton. Sorry about that, I couldn't find the, uh, the mute button, unmute. Um, but hey, comrades, my name is Ashton. I'm not a member of uh, DSA yet, and uh, I live in the Bay Area, I go by they, them pronouns. Um, this has been like an absolutely amazing uh, debate, and I've learned I've learned a lot. And I agree that like we should oppose sanctions, right? I think that like what a couple comrades have kind of talked about is that you know peace is 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 more likely going to be achieved, um, not not by sanctions, not by you know siding with the interest of one of one country's ruling class or conglomerate in terms of NATO. Um, it's going to be through um, you know. Um, you know, the global independent working class actions like, like boycotts, direct aid to, to Ukraine, mass protest. Um, it's going to be based on workers' ability to build solidarity, links across border, sorry, links across borders. I think, I think like, as is kind of common sense to us, victory is going to be proportional to the strength and, and class consciousness of the, of the, of the working class. And I think part of the, I think even if we try to like parse out like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll sanction, you know, the oligarchs, but not ordinary people. <clears throat> Um, we have to also also just like acknowledge the fact that all these countries that are um, opposing Russian imperialism and also you know Russian imperialism wants the same thing. They want to create a picture of national unity, and I don't think socialists should be should be kind of doing like helping the ruling classes uh, 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 do that. And we also have to acknowledge clearly that again sanctions are are acts of war, and that won't um, kind of uh, calm the, calm the situation. Um, I kind of worry about this kind of conversation about about um, opposing aid to um, uh, to Ukraine. I'm just imagining uh, just being a being a, an ordinary person in, in Ukraine and hearing that socialists in America are saying that you know we sh you shouldn't be accepting aid or we shouldn't be sending aid to uh, Ukraine. And I understand. I'm saying this as someone that's a, opposed to U.S. imperialism, and I realize that like the weapons that are that are that are going there are not meant to like to to save the national. Um, um, you know the, the the kind of independence movement, or and kind of nat the national aspirations of of Ukrainians. Uh, it's there as you know, serve as a kind of proxy against Russian Russian imperialism. But it doesn't. But it's it's um, but it's still the case that um, you know it's 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 the resistance to the um, the, the 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 Russian military, um, and then also kind of like the the appeals to kind of like to get Russians to uh, Russian military members to stop fighting. Um, you know that that that's going to make it more likely that that peace is there, and I think that we might alienate ourselves from ordinary Ukrainians that are in the resistance by saying that we shouldn't be sending sending weapons. But um, I do worry, like a lot of comrades have talked about, with the the far right. I think that like we have to acknowledge that weapons cross borders. Ukrainian Ukraine has a huge problem with with corruption and proliferation of of, of weapons. So the other thing I want to add, which just real quick with with the military part, is that like, you know, the U.S. and and, and NATO have been a part of the problem. Like why? some Ukrainian, like the Ukrainian government is asking for weapons in the first place. People don't, a lot of people don't realize that Ukraine, Ukraine had a mil had like a 780,000 person military and had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world, right? And, and, and basically after they gained independence, the US and NATO basically pressured them to, 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 to stop. And that was based on the, the NATO's own interests, not on the interest of, um, um, of, of Ukrainians. And I think just real quick on, on the point about like the US left, I think we have to be, um, we have to we have to be like cognizant of, of three of three things. I think that like um, we have to acknowledge that there there is a, a kind of uh, a boost in the new Cold War. China um, is now increasing their military budget by seven seven point one percent, and that's and that's another big increase from from the from the previous the previous year. The U.S. has just um, you know um, 
in 2022, signed it, signed the biggest military budget in, in its history, $778 billion. And now there's talk that 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 Biden's going to ask for $800 million, right? Um, you know, I think also we have to talk about the fact that like some elements of the of the of the, of the right, and especially like the oil industry, is is looking to to, to use this opportunity as an opportunity to boost oil nationalism. Um, it's going to be really key that we that we build that we build an anti-war movement today. So thank you, comrades. Thank you, Ashton. Um, okay, well, thanks everybody for your contributions. Um, I thought they were all very helpful for me and my understanding of the situation, and I think that. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, comrades for, um, you know, I as mentioned earlier, this is a very heated um, situation. I'm glad that the, I'm happy that the comrades uh, approach this discussion and debate um, uh, cordially and um, we were able to have it. Um, so we're going to move on to the, just the final contributions from the panelists. Each panelist will have five minutes and it'll just be a sum up of their positions and then we'll have a sum up by Paul Murphy and then uh, that will conclude the meeting. So we'll, the order will be Philip, Grayson and then Neil and then Paul. So go ahead, Philip. Yeah, I just want to second what everyone's been saying about how this has been a really I think, valuable discussion and you know this is a really complicated and difficult uh, uh, challenging time and we need more political discussions like, like this to, to, to find our bearings and be able to uh, have the sharpest approach. Um, and it's really great. I think it's really, we have a lot to be proud of in DSA. And I totally agree with the point that we need to stand together against sort of the liberal um, attacks and nationals attacks that we face. I do want to first and foremost clarify my position if I wasn't clear in the, uh, when I spoke earlier that yes, I. I do think we should oppose uh, the U.S. and and uh, NATO countries and the EU sending arms uh, to Ukraine. Um, I think that it is a challenging question, um, as I think Ashton just said, that at the same time, we I think we also want to stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian resistance against the Russian invasion. And of course, that's going to entail that that's an armed resistance. And there's also unarmed aspects of it. And I think we should politically support that armed resistance um, and, un and, 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 and the unarmed aspects of it. Um, but I, I think we also have to keep in mind that, that is what, there's, that's one level, but there's also the, great, the larger conflict here between US and Western imperialism and Russia, and that we do not support either side in that. And in that, and in, in that uh, context, the Western arms to Ukraine is part of that larger inter-imperialist rivalry. Um, and just to keep, also to keep how we have to keep a larger context in mind, it's totally ordinary and ordinary, ordinary Ukrainians who are resisting this invasion are calling on NATO to enforce a no-fly zone. I'm sure that's wildly popular amongst Ukrainians. My sympathy is with them. It's totally understandable that they would call for that, but we can't go along with that. Um, but, and it's similar, obviously that's not an easy thing to explain, but it's similar with the question of sending um, weapons. I think the, we have to start with also, there's no, the reality is they're getting weapons, right? The question is what should so, do socialists in the West go along with that? Or do we have a policy of total opposition to our ruling class and their agenda and their aims in this conflict? And I think we need to obviously start with, with support for the Ukrainian resistance, but speaking to a domestic audience our and, and being socialists in the United States, particularly socialists who are part of the US government, who endorse Joe Biden have an obligation to make crystal clear that we're in total opposition to the policy of the US government and US imperialism. Um, and, we have to, and we have to explain there's real, what are the motives? The US is not doing this out of humanitarian interests. We have genuine solidarity with the Ukrainian people, but that's not where the US is, is going. The other thing I really agree, I think Stefan made the point um, if there, if there's a genuine, if there was, um, we have to look at what's the character of the government that the West is giving these weapons to. This is a thoroughly capitalist government. It's aligned with NATO. But I think the most problematic aspect is that they are they have an anti-Russian policy within Ukraine, and they've carried out discrimination and repression of the Russian minority in Ukraine. And there's no viable peace on the basis of um, uh, some sort of discriminatory policy. That's a formula 
for new bloodshed, ethnic cleansing, civil wars. And we have to be, we're against the Russian uh, violation of Ukrainian rights that uh, under Putin's greater Russian policy. But we also, also have to oppose the Ukrainian discrimination against Russian minorities in Ukraine. And there has to be a democratic settlement. Um, if the, um, the last point I'll make about what's the strongest, we what are some of the strongest weapons that the Ukrainian resistance can use? I think it's related to that. Putin exploits, for, it's not that he genuinely cares about the Russian minority in Ukraine. The US government exploits the suffering of the, major the Ukrainian majority and they get an, e impact, an echo here in the US. In the same way, looking at it from a Russian perspective, Putin exploits and plays up the, uh, the repression and the, 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 the denial of language rights of the Russian minority in Ukraine. How can the Ukraine, what's the most powerful weapon the Ukrainian resistance has? One of the key, obviously they need an armed struggle, but they also, if they, if there was a, a third camp, if there was a third poll within the Ukrainian resistance that was saying, we support democratic rights for minorities in Ukraine. We're not against any repression of the Russian minority. We're for their right of self-determination. That enormously would facilitate building the anti-war movement in Russia. That would enormously facilitate um, demoralizing the Russian troops, more desertions, and mutinies within the Russian army. And that is a powerful weapon in this situation and building the anti-war movement around the world. And in Russia, I think that's the key thing. And that's also the framework of why we should oppose uh, the sanctions, which hurt the ability to build an anti-war movement and opposition in Russia um, to Putin. Thank you, Philip. Now we have Grayson next. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate this discussion. I think it was good. Um, Good to have. Um, yeah, to summarize, you know, my position on this and analysis on this. Um, I know, you know, none of us are experts. Um, apparently, the the, uh, the this is a a conflict that has raged uh, since 2014 at the cost of thousands and thousands of people's lives. Um, U.S. NATO uh, involvement uh, has significantly undermined, if not purposefully. Um, stop the peace process uh, implementation that, again, still on the table. Um, and as U.S.-based socialists, we should be doing everything in our power to recognize this, call this out, and then demand um, our government uh, pull out from this region, stop meddling, and let uh, Ukrainians um, have actual genuine sovereignty, you know, to, to the 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 you know, again, this is a conflict that has been predicted for years, for years, for decades, that if the United States pushed the buttons, uh, it, it would cause. And so the fact the United States that we're discussing, you know, again, lethal aid, uh, sending arms or whatever, that would, all we're doing is we're, we're benefiting the U.S. military industrial complex. Uh, they're the only ones who are making money off of this. Uh, there is no way functionally to be supporting armed resistance in Ukraine uh, that isn't supporting the American uh, capitalist class. Um, and it also isn't supporting uh, unnecessary and unneeded and, 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 and bloodshed uh, in Ukraine. You know, to the point that I earlier made that the, that, uh, the average Ukrainian doesn't want anything to do, to do with this. Uh, Zelensky, you know, uh, and when he turned uh, pro-NATO after the threats he received from the Ukrainian military, um, had about a approval rating, approval rating of 31% after winning a landslide election running on, on implementing the peace process. And when I say the average Ukrainian doesn't want anything to do with this, I don't mean that they don't want to resist an invasion. Um, I think that's obvious. Uh, everybody should and has the right to. Uh, but what I mean by that is that they don't want anything to do with the, uh, the, the NATO control influence, whatever you want to say, uh, current contemporaneous uh, Ukrainian government um, and the policies that are being forced upon the people there. People there want peace, and that's all they've wanted. They voted for it. They've made it clear. And so that's what we should be supporting as, as socialists, and we should support, be supporting the existing diplomatic framework, and we should be supporting and demanding the United States pull out and stop exacerbating the conflict in the region, and also call for Russia to pull out and, 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 um, and, and stop their invasion and stop their attacks on the Ukrainian people. Um, I think this is all pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, this doesn't really, you know, I don't think we need to delve into like 2003 rhetoric, um, you know, accusing or implying people are supportive of uh, 
people like uh, Putin with these positions, you know, recognizing that the Ukrainian state as it's composed, again, as it's composed against the will of the Ukrainian people, by the will of the United States, as it is composed, the far right nationalists have violent leverage over the government and, and, and therefore and exercise it. Like, that needs to be emphasized. It is against the will of the Ukrainian people. It's not the Ukrainian people who support the Zov Battalion. It's the United States and NATO who cleared the Zov Battalion being formally integrated into the Ukrainian military apparatus. That's who's doing it. And so we need to recognize that and recognize the consequences that that has had for the average Ukrainian person and the violence that it's ensued um, against the Russian minority, but also just against the, the Ukrainian public as a whole. Russia is wrong indubitably for invading. There's no if, ands, or buts, and I've said that before. But we have to be clear-eyed in our analysis of this situation. This is a situation that was brought upon, stage fomented, and uh, by the United States and NATO. And it's continuing to be. And any talk of sanction and any talk of military aid is talk of escalation of war and is talk of killing and maiming of innocent civilians who had nothing to do with this and have made it clear from day one that all they wanted was peace. And that's what we should be supporting as socialists. And I think we can do that. We can do that and we can be honest with that. And it's, I don't think it's uh, contradictory to demand that uh, you know, the capitalist governments negotiate diplomatically, right? Like diplomacy is a real thing. Uh, we've accomplished diplomacy before. Uh, the the uh, first uh, Yugoslavian conflict was ended with the Dayton Accords after a lot of violence, but there's still diplomacy. And so we should be realistic in our demands too. As much as I would love to see a socialist revolution um, in Ukraine, in, 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 in Russia, that's not the, what's going to immediately halt the, the, the violence, right? What is and realistically would, as indicated by governments involved, would be diplomacy. And so that's what we should be advocating for and that's what we should be demanding and we should be, uh, you know, again, clear-eyed in our analysis of this, and and you know, all solidarity to to all people in Ukraine who are suffering from this violent conflict, and, and have been suffering since 2014. Thank you. Thank you, Grayson. Uh, and finally, we have Neil. Go ahead, Neil. Thanks. Um, so first of all, it's been a great discussion. I really respect and appreciate all the contributions that have made been made by the comrades today. So. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'll start, I, I think we definitely, um, we have some slight disagreements on the panel and I think that's natural and, and good and it reflects the um, skill of reform and revolution and putting together a um, kind of multi-tendency uh, discussion. I, first of all, I agree with Grayson on the question of diplomacy. I mean, I, um, I uh, don't have confidence in the US government or any uh, capitalist government, but I also think that like the call for negotiations, the call for diplomacy is a necessary one. Um, and it's not one we should shy away from. Um, we also obviously have a disagreement about the character of the Ukrainian resistance. Like I said, I mean, I, I find the resistance movement at the moment um, incredibly inspiring, just you know, as I find the anti-war movement in Russia inspiring. Um, we'll see where it goes from here. I mean, wars have a terrible effect on people and in the, in the course of a war, uh, right-wing forces probably have a, um, uh, a leg up in trying to position themselves. Um, so we have to kind of constantly be analyzing and figuring out what's going on in, in Ukraine um, and what's going on with the resistance. But at the moment, from what I can tell, it seems to be like a popular uh, broad uh, resistance to an imperialist uh, invasion. Um, the question of arms as we talk about is tricky. Like I said, Bread and Roses and myself do not, we don't have a position on this issue, um, but I am like thinking about it and I uh, was appreciative, appreciative of the opportunity to think about it with all of you. Um, I continue to struggle uh, with how we can support the Ukrainian resistance while also saying we should embargo the ongoing sale of weapons. Um, I just don't see how you can reconcile the two positions. Um, I don't agree with the claim, for example, that neo-Nazis run the entire resistance movement but there is a logical consistency to the position. There is a logical consistency to the position that if they do, it makes sense to embargo the sale of weapons to them. Um, and I think the challenge for us, uh, for those of us who have a much more positive uh, analysis of the Ukrainian resistance, the challenge for us is to figure out how do we continue to support them while also uh, dealing with this question of uh, weapons shipments uh, and sales. 
Um, I want to end on reiterating where we think we have consensus because I actually think we have a lot of agreement today, um, which is really good. Um, we all oppose the escalation, any escalation by NATO, including a no-fly zone. Um, we all oppose sanctions against uh, the Russian people, uh, any form of economic warfare. Um, we're all opposed to Putin's invasion and we condemn it pretty strongly. Um, and I think we all recognize the danger of the far right in, in Ukraine, um, which can't be denied. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, it's something that we have to continue to be concerned about and keeping our eyes on. Um, so I'll end by thanking the organizers, thanking the panelists. Um, it's been a really good uh, discussion and I learned a lot from it and I uh, hope to be able to continue to be uh, to participate in these kind of discussions and uh, follow the great work that Reform and Revolution is doing. Thank you, Neil. And I wanna again thank the US panelists, um, Grayson, Philip, and Neil for their contributions. Um, so we'll have Paul Mar Murphy summing up for five minutes. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks a lot. I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the discussion of what is obviously a quite horrific uh, topic in terms of the impact that it's having on uh, people. Um, just to, um, yeah, I mean, I, so I'm going to disagree with some of the panelists because I think it's, I think it's useful to draw it out. I think that's one of the positive aspects of the of the meeting. Um, I I think an important like reason for the differences in approach that the three different approaches, which are kind of nuanced enough between them, have is how you characterize what's going on. Into what category do you place the conflict? So I I, I feel um, I try and look at Neil's or sorry Grayson's screen here so he can shake his head vigorous at me if he disagrees. But I feel that Grayson like primarily sees what's happening through the lens of an interim periodist conflict in which you know the main responsibility is placed on, on the US. Um, and I felt that Neil uh, primarily sees this through the, through the lens of this an imperialist invasion of Russia, of sorry, by Russia of uh, Ukraine, which Grayson denies in a sense. And that's not how Grayson sees what's happening there. He sees it purely through that lens. And I think, like, I think it's both. I think there is a Russian imperialist invasion of Ukraine. And um, I, I just think there's a huge amount of evidence to, to back that up in terms of Putin's own uh, words, in terms of the historical relationship um, between Russia and uh, Ukraine. And I therefore think that the reaction of Ukrainian people of, of overwhelmingly be against it is fully uh, justified and like is it appears to be extremely widespread and so like you know i'm in that struggle i am with the ukrainian people against the russian invasion um but i also think like there is actually an inter-imperialist conflict going on like one of the things neil said earlier and i think you know there's there's truth to this is that like putin's the aggressor if you look into what's actually been happening putin is is the aggressor and I think that's that's true if you look at the last 14 days or last even last last month or whatever in terms of massive military buildup and so on. Um, but I think we have to like zoom out a little bit from that. And if you zoom out a little bit from that, well, then the picture changes quite a lot. Um, you know, there's this famous speech by Karl Liebknecht, um, which is titled The Main Enemies at Home. And he finishes with the main enemies at home in terms of kind of orienting the anti-war movement in an anti-imperialist, in an inter-imperialist conflict. Um, but one of the important points he makes before then is learn everything, don't forget anything. And he kind of goes through all the things that, like this huge war propaganda and so on, and they're trying to get you to forget everything that's led up to this point. And I think like we have to insist on everything that's led up to this point. We in the like Western camp, broadly speaking, and the responsibility for NATO um, without, and again, giving any justification for the uh, for the Russian invasion of, of uh, Ukraine, but like that there are two aggressors here in the overall inter-imperialist conflict over a period of almost two decades, um, and that includes NATO. And I think when you also look at it through that lens, I think it does clarify um, the questions of sanctions and the question of sending arms in, in the negative, in my opinion, that like we should not um, we should be opposing um, both of those things because they're part of that, like fundamentally, because they're part of that inter-imperialist uh, conflict. Um, and I do think like, 
obviously, look, I'm not going to cry any tears at all if Putin's oligarchs were sanctioned and so on. Obviously, they're not our friends at all. But I think even for us to like point in that direction or to raise that as that's what should be doing, the implication is, oh, the main enemy is in Russia, as opposed to the main enemy is at home, which I think is a good kind of, it's a guide for us in terms of understanding, like trying to clarify things for people about the responsibility of imperialism uh, worldwide and so on. Just one word in terms of diplomacy, obviously, yeah, like, you know, if, if sometimes if, if I was on TV or something and someone asked me, I'm for de-escalation, yes, I'm immediately I'm for diplomacy and so on. I think it's not wrong to say you're in favor of diplomacy and you favor an anti-war movement bringing pressure to bear on the ruling class to force them to scale back and so on. Um, but in terms of like the main things that we raise, I don't think we should be mainly pointing in that direction. Um, in the sense that, again, it's like the Karl Liebknecht thing, that you're trying to orient the movement and you're trying to orient the anti-war movement and the socialist movement. And the main, like the end we need to get to is we need to overthrow their, their the ruling class, we need to overthrow their system. And like, I accept that that isn't the likely way that this immediate conflict is going to um, end. You know, I, I agree with that, but we need to do things now and raise demands now and build a movement now that is independent of the ruling class and that points away from them just solving things and points toward the power of ordinary um, people. So I think that applies in the here and now in terms of like raising points of assistance for ordinary people. So the Ukrainian Federation of Trade Unions has launched an appeal and so on. I think they're the kind of things in terms of practical things that ordinary people can do with Ukrainian uh, people in the here and now. Um, but also in terms of like the main demands and stuff that we raise should be less, I think, about like getting them, implying that they're going to sol solve all the problems. Because diplomacy is also an instrument of inter-imperialist conflict and imperialist uh, rivalry and so on. And things will be will be resolved in their turn. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll finish on this point. The final thing, which is that I think, like, obviously it is horrendous situation. Um, and I think right now there's huge propaganda um i'm sure in the us because i i see it here in in europe um and that that's inevitable i think at the start of this stage of the of a conflict um but i i think like we're now likely in a period of more open conflict between different imperialist powers today it's us and and russia and nato nato and russia really um but tomorrow it may be nato and uh, china for example i think that's the kind of period that we're that we're in um and initially, the enormous pressure and propaganda and so on for people to support their own sides. But the example of the First World War does show that can turn around, that people quite quickly can get fed up with paying for this war, can get fed up with, like, can, you know, learn and come to realize this is a war on behalf of not my interest, but on behalf of the, the oligarchs on all sides. Let's call them capitalists. Um, and instead, you know, lead people in a, in a direction of being very anti-war. And that that, you know, a world of obvious war, of conflict, of imperialism and so on, um, can be the opener of the door of the possibility of socialist revolution. Um, that obviously was an important factor in, in Russia in 1917. Um, and therefore, like, that's why I think, like, how we orient ourselves, pointing towards independent working class movement, independent anti-war movement and so on, is vital in terms of what we're doing uh, now. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Paul. And I want to thank everybody and the panelists uh, for speaking and for everybody who contributed and everybody who was here today before everybody leaves. So uh, I do want to highlight two things. I, I posted two links in the chat. One is for our, up, for our next upcoming r, &R National uh, Public Zoom meeting, which will be on labor and, the, and DSA. It's entitled, uh, DSA and the rank and file strategy. Uh, we'll have Laura Gabby from the NPC. Uh, we'll also have a speaker from Tempest and also uh, a speaker from Ty Moore from Reform Revolution and probably and maybe other speakers as well. So I encourage you to, to attend that on April 3rd, um, Sunday, April 3rd. I think that these sort of discussions that we've had today and that we'll have next month on labor I think are vital for DSA and for the socialist movement. And unfortunately, there's a paucity of, of uh, these sort of uh, political discussion and debate between different tendencies to try to figure out what is the best way forward in these complex times. 
So I think it is, this, these are vital discussions and I encourage all the comrades who are on the call to come to the next one and to invite friends. And just to let you know that we, will, we have these meetings every month. Uh, and so we have a new topic each month, invite different tendencies and have a discussion about it. And it dovetails obviously with, with the key political issues that DSA is facing and the left is facing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is this caucus, Reform Revolution. We are a Marxist caucus in DSA. We do walk in the, in the tradition of Leon, Trotsky, and, and Lenin and the other Bolsheviks. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about our politics, about getting involved, and maybe even joining our caucus, uh, please follow that link that I put and sign up, and somebody will reach out to you. And if you're not sure, if you want to get involved with us, it's totally fine. You can, we have a magazine that we produce that's right behind me, the, the most recent I issue, uh, which is the main theme is on labor, where we discuss, go into depth about the rank and file strategy, um, you know, kind of parsing out fact and fiction. Is it really in play? What, what's, what's DSA's approach to labor? What should DSA's approach be to labor? Also tax, tackles a key question of what is the labor bureaucracy and how do, we, um, how do we relate to it? How do we approach to it? And there's also other articles in there about Starbucks workers uh, uprising and um, uh, other key articles as well about Roe v. Wade and that sort of thing. So I encourage comrades to check that out. Uh, get a subscription, it's very cheap uh, for a beautiful in-depth magazine. Um, and that you could get that just on the link of reformandrevolution.org. Um, okay, well, that concludes the meeting. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here and I will hopefully see you on April 3rd for our next meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, comrades.